Without further ado, I'd like to bring up Mayor Lida Krusen to help open our uh, discussion and have some remarks. Mayor Krusen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many people here for this really important topic this morning. And it's my honor to be with you here to sort of kick this off with a couple of remarks. Um, certainly, we have, a, I think, the people in the room that can really help to make progress on this subject. So that is very encouraging to me. Because some of the numbers that I'll give you here this morning are will not sound so encouraging. Uh, it's going to take all of us. Opiate abuse, as you know, is a multifaceted problem. And for us to turn the corner on this epidemic, it's going to take a data-driven, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so I'm very happy to see and chat with such a diverse audience here today and to join in the discussion on solutions and calls to action. Uh, in attendance here today, there are public health officials, welcome, health care providers, representatives from faith-based communities, private citizens, members of law enforcement, elected officials, community organizations, our regional university and research partners, and, and many others. So uh, why are we all here? Most of you know that already, I think, but uh, the op opioid problem is a complex national, state, and local problem. And I want to just share a few statistics with you from St. Louis City uh, from last year. In 2016, now let me back up and say St. Louis City is about 62 square miles, 315,000 people, give or take. So not a real big place. In 2016, there were 273 drug overdose deaths involving opiates in the city of St. Louis. And that compares with 131 in 2015, so more than double from 2015 to 2016. In 2016, the number of overdose deaths involving opiates was the highest in the southern portion of our city, specifically the zip code 63111, 118 and 116, and they made up 36% of the total cases. And that might not be what you would be expecting, so that's why I think it's important to note that this morning. One third of all the opiate overdose deaths in the city involved one or more substance. One fifth of the overdose deaths in the city involved alcohol also. Majority of the opiate mortality cases involved heroin and fentanyl. Uh, 97 involved heroin, 100 involved fentanyl, 53 involved both, 28 involved in opiate other than heroin or fentanyl. So thank you for being here because obviously I think that demonstrates the, the severity of this, of this problem. Um, and I would also just maybe uh, go off remarks here a little bit to say that an awful lot of those people are our young people. And not all of them, of course, but an awful lot of them are our young people. So this is, is really a situation that, that is um, very serious on helping folks become productive uh, members of our society. Uh, I want to give a thank you, a big thank you to the Summit's planning team. Uh, they're in your program here today. I understand the team originally planned for about 400 people, and the final count was over 500. And so we're thrill thrilled that that many people uh, have registered and taken this so seriously. I do want to give a, a big shout out to Director Melba Moore of the St. Louis City Health Department for her hard work. And a special thank you to Dean David Pomer. Earl Mutter, easy for me to say, Washington University School of Medicine Executive Vice President, Executive Vice Chancellor and Dean for allowing us to use this great facility. Uh, thank you to St. Louis County Executive Steve Stanger and Dr. Fazel Khan, who could not be here this morning. But um, the reason to really uh, recognize them this morning is that they're 
leadership last year, about a year and a half ago now, was very important. Most of you know that St. Louis County established Missouri's first PDMP, Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, to battle opiate abuse and the soaring overdose deaths. Uh, the city of St. Louis was the first jurisdiction to join with St. Louis County's PDMP, but there are now uh, counties representing 58 percent of the state's population that have come on board. So uh, I do want to recognize that leadership from St. Louis County Executive Steve Stanger and Dr. Kahn for, for their leadership. And so thank you all for being here this morning. Um, really appreciate the seriousness with which you are all taking this, this issue and uh, look forward to the progress and to all of, uh, all of us working together in order to uh, try to really reduce this, this very sad and serious trend. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mayor Krusen, uh, for those comments. Uh, I'm, doc I'm Dr. Ross. I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Diversity, and I chair the St. Louis City Board of Health. And we've been addressing this issue for quite some time. Uh, and it's just really in, uh, just uh, warming to see the group assembled here uh, who are also very committed to ameliorating this uh, uh, nationwide, statewide uh, epidemic. Uh, as a public health official, uh, Director Moore and I recognize that we need a, a long-term preventive health strategy. Uh, not just focusing on the treatment of opioid uh, users uh, on the street, uh, but a strategy which really focuses on prevention, uh, a care that is delivered um, both uh, in acute settings and ambulatory care settings, as well as a focus on engaging the provider, the community on awareness, uh, and strategies such as you'll hear a lot more about our, our uh, medical assisted treatment strategies, behavioral strategies, and recovery strategies uh, addressing uh, trauma in our community and how to deliver trauma-informed care as a way of ameliorating this crisis. And so at the end of the day, I hope that you will walk out here with this sense of how we can move uh, collectively, how we can use our collective impact to really address this issue here in St. Louis, across the state, and nationwide. Uh, now, it is my pleasure to introduce um, the Dean of Washington University School of Medicine uh, and the Executive Vice Chancellor for Medical Affairs, Dr. David Perlmutter. Dr. Perlmutter has been Dean for two years uh, and has uh, taken great strides to advance our scientific efforts, uh, addressing some of the major issues uh, in, our, in our country uh, using personalized medicine. But he is a broad visionary who has looked at effective ways of addressing uh, age-dependent uh, 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 degeneration, uh, as well as liver disease and population health. And so uh, we are proud to have this visionary here for two years and much more coming forth. And so I can throw mother. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks, Melba, for um, uh, everything you're doing on this. And I want to welcome all of you to our campus. And uh, we consider it a great honor to have you all here and to um, help in the progress that you are going to make on this critically important subject. And thank you all for what you're doing to tackle the opioid crisis. This school has a long tradition of using its intellectual resources for education and research to better the health of the community and also um, to provide that health care and a deep commitment to being a safety net provider for this community. And as part of that deep commitment, we want to leverage every aspect and every resource that we can to help develop and implement solutions for the epidemic uh, of this I issue. Now the leading cause of academic accidental deaths in the United States, some 91 people die from opioid overdose uh, each day in the United States. Washington University School of Medicine already has a number of efforts that are ongoing, but we look to try to partner with all of you and um, we have a long way to go. Ted Cicero from our Department of Psychiatry, who you will hear from today, is a world's authority on understanding abuse patterns. For 25 years, he has been worrying about this problem, 
charting addicts' motivations, and predicting emerging abuse patterns around the country. He and his colleagues were the first to identify changing demographics as opioid addiction spread from the inner city to the suburbs, and also predicted the shift from painkillers to, uh, to heroin and to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. He has shown us that an understanding of these factors and what motivates abuse can lead to methods for mitigating the epidemic. Our Department of Anesthesiology, um, under the leadership of Dr. Alex Evers and with the work of Dr. Michael Botros, who is here today, is developing now a first-of-its-kind clinic to help transition patients during the first 30 days after they are discharged from the hospital. This is tentatively being called our Transitional Care Medicine Clinic. Approximately 6% of opioid naive patients continue on opioids one year after surgery, leading to an annual incidence of three to five million new opioid dependent patients per year. Since prevention is always better than treatment, this clinic will work with surgeons and surgical subspecialists all over this campus to develop post-discharge care paths and reduce the number of opioid pills to prescribed as well as the number of patients who will be on the medications for any length of time. In addition, the School of Medicine, through its Department of Anesthesiology and the St. Louis College of Pharmacy, have started in a partnership, a unique partnership, to create a center called the Center for Clinical Pharmacology that will be focused on and has already focused on better, safer, and more effective ways to use medications for pain relief. In particular, we have some evidence that there are ways to produce opioids that can provide pain relief but have a much more limited addictive potential than the currently available. And these things are actually very close to becoming, uh, uh, to be to use in the clinical environment. In the center, pharmacists work side by side with physicians on innovative ways to develop those kinds of new therapies. Also, tackling the opioid crisis here at Washington University School of Medicine. And this I consider to be one of the most important things for us to encourage here is uh, to tap into the energy of our students. Currently, the students have an organization called Sling Health, which they run, to get, uh, they run as students. It was founded by the Washington University Medical Students, but it now includes students in all of the programs across the university. These students also have partnered with our clinical faculty and local entrepreneurs to develop and commercialize med tech solutions to improve patient health care. One of those companies, which is already now active, is eFarmix. This is a startup company that's using digital short text, short text message technology to help patients who are at risk for opioid addiction by, communicate, by allowing them to communicate more effectively with their providers. eFarmic's two-directional communication platform can direct patients to needed behavioral health services and help mitigate the potential problems that lie ahead. We plan to tap into these students and their energy to be a much bigger part of helping us implement solutions. Last, I want to just mention that we are in the planning phases of a new educational pro program on substance abuse for our students. As part of curriculum renewal that will be ongoing in the next two years at the School of Medicine, being led by Eva Agard and Tom Defer. We are developing a curriculum for understanding the determinants of opioid use as part of a broader emphasis here on this campus on social determinants of health. 
we will be engaging key stakeholders on campus and in the community to help us with this process. Thank you again for allowing us to be your host and to participate in this summit. We feel that we are a part of this community and all of you and want very much to be working together with you in ways that will help the most vulnerable in our community. Thank you. I'm back again, so we're getting ready to roll our sleeves up. And here's the other thing I want to say. We have to make sure that we're all on the same page with this issue. I was asked this morning, and I felt a little bit some kind of way, because I was asked, well, what are you doing? Like, we haven't been doing anything. Well, let me share with you what's, did you hear what Dr. Perlmutter said? This is about number one, we got to be on the same page. We have to understand what we need to do and strategize together. You can't willy-nilly this. This is important. These are about lives that we're talking about. And we have to assure our families that we're doing the right thing. We have to educate our families. So today is about having a discussion, recognizing your role in this, this situation, and rolling your sleeves up, coming to the table, and let's make it happen, and let's get something done. Thank you. And let's be fact-based. Fact-based. You're going to hear, uh, I, somebody said the Narcan's not working. Let's dispel that myth right now. Let's dispel it right now. Chad's going to come up and talk to us about this, and we're going to get on the right pathway in the right way, okay? All right. Mark Stringer is here from the Missouri Department of Mental Health. And it would, if it had not been for one of my partners, this is one of my partners, well, you just pick up the telephone and you call and say, I need some help. And they stand up quickly. That's what we have to do. And we can't be afraid to do that. And I know I'm not a conventional kind of person, but that's why all of you all love me. <laughs> Mark, come on up. Good morning. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that you're here during this busy time of year. This is the the uh, ninth summit that we've had across the state and the last one. It's also the largest summit that we've had. Um, and so uh, thank you for participating. Um, and in particular, I want to thank uh, uh, Melba Moore for her leadership in, in pulling all this together. Um, I also want to thank one of my uh, fellow cabinet members, um, Carol Comer. Well, stand up, Carol. <laughs> Carol is the director of the Department of Natural Resources. Um, Governor Greitens has charged all 16 of his state department heads to, to have a role in the, uh, our efforts uh, to, to deal with the opiate epidemic. Now, you might wonder, as, as Carol did initially, what, what would the Department of Natural Resources have to do with this, with this issue? Well, uh, Carol has actually developed a fairly elaborate strategy, and just one, one part of that is, you, you probably don't know that Missouri has 44 state park rangers. And so one day, a few months ago, uh, we trained 38 of those park rangers in how to administer Narcan. And now all the park rangers carry Narcan because they do encounter people that overdose in state parks. So it's just one small example. Um, her presence here, along with uh, other cabinet members at other summits, is evidence that the governor has placed the opiate epidemic high on his list of priorities. And I'd like for you to hear it directly from him in this very short video. Thank you for recognizing how important this problem is and for stepping forward and joining us, each of us in your own ways, to take action, to do something positive uh, to save lives. Opioids are, are a modern plague. We're losing two people a day here in the state of Missouri. Two children a day are born here in the state of Missouri suffering from narcotic withdrawal. We have a serious problem here in the state of Missouri. For every 100,000 people, we have 89,000 prescriptions for narcotics. 
What is going to help us to move forward is if we can connect the tremendous heart and the tremendous passion of people who have seen this crisis, who've been affected by this crisis, and then connect that to positive action in our communities, together we can save lives. We've asked everyone to step forward and find what we can do. And the reason why we've done that is because the only way that we're going to solve this problem in the state of Missouri is if all of us find a way to step forward and do different. You know, my boxing coach used to always say to me and to all the guys who he trained, if you want different, do different. The message was very simple. To all of us who he trained, he'd say, if you want a different result from your life, then you have to take different action. If we want a different result from what's happened with the opioid epidemic here in the state of Missouri, we're going to have to take different action. And I'm proud of the fact that we're doing that. Government has a role to play, but government alone cannot solve this problem. So let's do this together. And if we do it together, we can save lives. Um, we at the state level uh, and uh, have been focusing our opioid related efforts on things like expanding access to medical treatment for people with opiate use disorders, including the use of, of uh, newer medications, uh, increasing overdose education and, and naloxone distribution, establishing a statewide prescription drug monitoring program that reinforces local jurisdictions' voluntary PDMPs, training physicians and other prescribers, signing the Good Samaritan Bill into law, and implementing prescription drug misuse prevention programs. We also have a newly developed opioid website that is fairly comprehensive and can be found at opioids.mo.gov. Finally, I need to acknowledge the, uh, the local efforts that have been undertaken here in St. Louis, which really has led the way in the state to address the opioid issues. Um, and, and you've been doing this for a while now and saved many lives. Two last, two last things. One is um, uh, Dr. Randall Williams is the director of the Department of Health and Senior Services, and Dr. Williams has been at all the other summits. He couldn't be here today. He was in, he's in Washington, D.C. Um, but he's, he's started a tradition of giving out his personal cell phone number at these events and encouraging people to call him anytime if they have questions or follow-up or advice, whatever. So I'm going to continue that uh, tradition <laughs> by giving out his cell phone number <laughs> for you to call anytime, day or night. <laughs> he seriously asked me to do this, so uh, it's 919-413-7791. Dr. Williams also wanted me to, to remind you to get a flu shot. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, flu cases are up 400 percent over over what they were last time. This time last year, so it's a it's it's quite a serious issue. So um, again, I want to I want to thank um, thank Melba for her her leadership, uh, Governor Greitens for his leadership at the state level uh, on this important issue, and thank all of you for being here this morning. So uh, throughout the day, there, we're going to do some polling. There will be some questions that you get to ask and answer to respond to. Um, I really seriously want you to take note, ask questions, engage, be engaged in the conversation so that we can identify the role that we each play in this, in this very important issue. Well, I want to bring our MC up. Fred Bottomer, as you know, we, you hear it over and over, it takes all of us, all of us are engaged, all of us involved. Well, here's a role that we, for today, that the media will play in assisting us in just facilitating the discussion that we're going to have. So I want to bring Fred up, and Fred, you're going to get us started this morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today, and an honor, I'm honored to be asked to MC this event. So thank you, Commissioner, and to the St. Louis City Health Department for asking. Uh, I'm, I'm usually in radio, which means I'm in a small studio of, like, just me. So speaking in front of 400 people here and another 100 plus in the overflow room is uh, something new. So please bear with me for that. Uh, over the next few hours, uh, we're going to hear, continue to hear some concerning numbers 
Already, I've heard one. Uh, Mayor Krusen said that the zip code 63118 is one of the three worst zip codes for opioid and heroin addiction. And uh, that's where I grew up. That's where my family, my parents, my sisters still live. So that's alarming to hear that. I didn't know that. Um, another alarming number we'll probably hear is that nearly 700 people in the St. Louis region last year died of overdoses. And again, that's this entire room plus the overflow room of people that are no longer here because of this crisis. Uh, the, but we're also going to hear some optimistic stories, I hope, of recovery. And we'll hear about some stepped up efforts that everyone in this room are, is taking to try and, and tackle this crisis. Uh, the opioid crisis hits me personally in a small way. My wife is an intake counselor at St. Anthony's Hospital. So every day when she comes home from work, I hear the stories of people that come in seeking help. Every night she comes home late because there are so many people coming in seeking help. There are so many stories to be told, so much help that needs to be given. Uh, Commissioner mentioned the polling that we're going to do throughout the morning. We have had four or five polling questions that we want to ask. And there are a couple ways that you can respond to the polls while you're in your seats here listening to what's going on. And uh, we can do it two ways. You can text message a response to the number 587-316-3408, 587-316-3408. Or you can go online at tallyspace.com slash vote slash 8117. And before we move on to some of our speakers, I want to give you the first question that you can take time to respond to. We're going to have three questions before the first break around 1020-ish. And at that time, we'll announce the results of those three, three polling questions. The first one, how many people in your community do you know have a problem with any kind of opioid? One, none? Two, one, three, two to five, four, too many to count. So while you're sitting there listening to our speakers and in between speakers, you may want to register your vote. And we'll have another polling question before we introduce the next speaker. Uh, the first speaker that I get to introduce, I'm honored to introduce, it's uh, Dr. Theodore Cicero. Dr. Cicero is a professor and vice chairman for research in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Cicero received his PhD in neuropharmacology from Purdue in 1969. He's been at WashU ever since. In addition to his university positions, Dr. Cicero serves on the editorial board for many journals, and he's an expert advisor to the World Health Organization's Substance Abuse Advisory Group. Now I'm honored to introduce Dr. Cicero, who's going to set it all up for us today. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to come have the opportunity to speak with you today. This is the ninth of these uh, summits. I've been at six of them. So those of you who heard me before, you can sort of tune it out, and I feel sorry for you, actually, but you have to, you have to hear it all over again. But uh, just a couple of facts leading, uh, leading off the discussion, just, just for you to know. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's the first slide. My email is in the lower left-hand corner. And if you want to email me, please feel free to do so. I'd love any feedback I can get from people, any information they can get. A lot of people volunteer to do something, which is, which is great as well. Uh, but I, I really would, would enjoy that opportunity, so don't hesitate at all. Uh, the slide presentation, I tend to follow it sometimes, and then I sort of jump around on it. But it is the full file is actually on, going to be on the website, and you can just access that and look at uh, slides and the uh, uh, publications that we're, we're talking about as well. This is going to be a review of the whole literature base, but it will be a focus on my own research here at WashU. I've been here again for a long time, 
uh, and been studying this particular problem for at least 25 years. Why is it important? Uh, as a country, we represent worldwide about 5% of the world's population. We consume well over 90% of all the opioids produced in the world. Now, this either indicates we're a very sick people, which I don't think we are, although after the last election, who knows? Uh, but I should have said that. Forget it. Scratch that, Scratch that uh, off. Uh, or, or there's a good indication that people are uh, we're using drugs either too liberally or other countries are using uh, drugs too uh, cautiously. Uh, that is, remains to be seen. My own interpretation is we're, we're prescribing too many uh, drugs here, disproportionate to our population, and I don't think we're, we're ill. The second is uh, the individual differences that you can see here are very, very strikingly clear. Uh, there's a great experiment done in the 1940s. You could never do it today. It would be totally illegal and no, no uh, human studies committee would ever uh, pass on that. That was actually in a, a prison in uh, uh, Kentucky where they actually gave prisoner plus all the staff members a single injection of morphine IV. And 90% of the people found that to be the most ridiculous, horrible feeling they'd ever had. They rated it very low on the liking scale, never wanted to see it again, which is sort of a typical response for more people, most people who take opioids for uh, a pain condition. But 10% of that population said it was the greatest feeling they ever had. Uh, that gives you this, this little subpopulation of people. Obviously, there's something genetic there, there's something biologic there that drives these people, for whatever reason, to love this medication. And these are the ones that we've got to be most at risk for as we look ahead. So we're not all vulnerable. Uh, you can be made vulnerable, but at least in terms of vulnerability, it seems like a very sub, uh, small subset of people who are all actively trying to investigate and see what it is about these people that make them uh, into this situation. Uh, with that stated, uh, and again, this is an individual problem. It's, it's a bio biologically based problem that we've got to attack. How did this whole thing start? And again, I'm setting the stage for everybody else who will cover uh, specifics uh, of this. I'd love for there to be questions at the end of it, but I don't know that we're going to have time uh, to, for, to do that. But we, we, we can try to squeeze some in. Uh, the first event that occurred is on the next slide. Actually, these are my publications. Well, if you could get it to work. Uh, in the last three years or so, work we've been doing. I know you can't, you can't see that, you certainly can't write it down. It's in this slide deck, and please, if you want more information on this, uh, go ahead and do so. I should say as a preface, we have interviewed 25,000 drug addicts over the last 25 years. So we have a pretty good idea, and our whole goal was to see what it is that drives these people to take drugs, what pleasure or reinforcement do they get from these drugs, because if we can know that, if we can see what the demand characteristics of this phenomenon are, we may be able to attack it better in a prevention uh, in, a tr in a treatment mode. But the opiate epidemic started two major developments occurring in the 1990s, late, late to, uh, 2000s. The most significant was the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare, I think it's now called a Joint Commission, uh, actually uh, went through a, a medical education, thought that pain management was very uh, underreported, undertreated. Uh, and that they were, in general, the country was ignoring this pain. They made a recommendation that the country should list pain as a fifth vital sign. So whenever you have a physical, you should ask the patient what level their, their pain and, and, and discomfort uh, is. Uh, that's a laudable goal. Uh, it even made the a cover of Time magazine uh, that uh, this is a, a national crisis. We're not prescribing enough medication that we know works on uh, the way of opiates. Predictably, this led physicians to all of a sudden, because now patients were coming in saying, I have all this pain, so physicians were now treating it aggressively. Unfortunately, associated with treating aggressively, we always have some side effects uh, that occur with it, and we saw a big side effect. And this just looks at the number of prescriptions written uh, over that period of time, quadrupled the number of prescriptions that were written in terms of kilos of, of uh, opiates released. And you look at the parallel curves of the opi uh, uh, deaths from opioids uh, and treatment admissions. So you know, therapeutically, you would assume it stays in the channel, but the whole point of this slide is it doesn't. Some percentage of a therapeutically prescribed drug is going to get out into the public and be used for non-therapeutic purposes. That's just something you have to recognize up front that that's going to occur. The second major development was the release of an extended release version of oxycodone. Oxycodone is Percodan or Percocet. Uh, many of you probably were exposed to that. Uh, the dose in that typical uh, pill 
is five milligrams and the rest of it is acetaminophen. It turns out that most people in addicts, especially who like to grind up their pills, uh, solubilize it, inject it, find acetaminophen to be extremely painful and irritating to the nasal passages and, and IV administration. Oxycodone, extended release, on the other hand, uh, needed to have a large reservoir because its purpose was to leak out over a 24-hour period. So he had to load enough up in the uh, reservoir that there would be sustained release for, for 24 hours. Now this meant there was about 30 milligrams of pure oxycodone, no acetaminophen at this point. That turns out to be critical and pivotal because drug addicts, again, they do not like acetaminophen. But here you had a preparation that contained 30 milligrams compared to the usual dose of five milligrams that you might get from Percodan or, 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 or uh, Percocet. This led to an immediate, within 48 hours of the release of extended release oxycodone, there were recipes on the internet describing how to defeat the mechanism and extract all of the, the native oxycodone. Significance of that is, first, not, not only are addicts very clever, and there are a lot of chemists that are very clever, uh, there are a couple factors about that. How did the company and the FDA miss this? Very obvious fact that this was likely to happen. They thought because it had a slow release, it goes back to Site 101, the longer the delay between the action and the behavior, uh, you're, you're not going to learn it as well. Or it won't have as much reward. There was an assumption since this was an extended release preparation that that, in fact, would be the case. The response would be so delayed that people would really wouldn't take it. No one thought to look to see whether you could manipulate uh, the apparatus. Uh, this resulted in a huge surge of now pure oxycodone, not adulterated with acetaminophen out there, but pure oxycodone, and it, it just took off. So you have the two things happening. You have patients, or physicians rather, giving a great many uh, prescriptions out uh, for opiates, and you also have now diversion to the street of pure oxycodone unadulterated by acetaminophen. These are the two pivotal events that occurred that led to the, all, the situation we're, we're facing today. Why are prescription opioids so attractive? I think, you know, it's a really good question. And, and since they were out there, it just doesn't describe it enough. Well, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. They're legal. Uh, for, first point up here, uh, they're prescribed by doctors. They are seen as a safer drugs, and, they, and most of our addicts will say, uh, at least I'm not taking heroin. So it's a pure grade uh, prescription drug, and in some ways that's an acceptable uh, form of, of abusing uh, opiates, whereas um, prescription drugs uh, really aren't. Uh, trustworthy and predictable, the dosage is readily identifiable. You pick up a tablet, you can see what its marking is, see what color it is, you know this is what you, you're suspecting to get. So there's no guesswork involved. You know, if I take one of these tablets, I'm going to get high. If I take two, I'm going to get a little bit higher, and I don't want to exceed four or five, something along those, uh, those lines. And there's really no stigma associated with this, at least that's the belief, that I'm not a junkie, I take pills that are legal and prescribed by a doctor. One comment from one of our patients is, I mean, a doctor prescribes it to you, they can't be that bad. And this was a prevailing assumption in the late 90s and into, the, the, into this century, up until about five years ago, that uh, they, they can't be that bad. They're legal again and, and it's highly predictable. The initial opiate exposure, what do people experience when they first take that drug? And again, I'm laying out groundwork so you can kind of understand as you hear later today about the, the devastation these have caused, why are they so attractive in the first place? And again, now a subset of people, not all, but a subset on initial exposure will say minutes after doing this, my first time I felt like there was not a care in the world to me, nothing and no one existed except for me and the amazing high I was feeling. This is an overwhelming response that they receive, at least in that first, that first exposure uh, to opiates. The most succinct reason that, that was given by someone is this one. It was like God was petting me. Now I'm not real sure what that feels like. But if you really do believe in, in a God and being in the arms of God, this is what the person meant, being protected and insulated from bad things happening to them, and just this magnificent feeling, imagining it must be what, what God feels like. That's a very, very powerful motivator to continue to take drugs. Imagine that. You can get in contact with your inner self. Uh, you, you'll feel at peace with the world. Uh, and again, you feel this comfort state that's almost indescribable. Unfortunately, there were unanticipated benefits, of, and I use that in quotes, leading to misuse. And the most important fact here is, if you look at opiate abusers as a whole, and again, we've interviewed 25,000 over the years, and this is supported by the literature as well, 75% of the people that we surveyed uh, indicated they used opiates to self-medicate psychiatric problems. 
85 self-reported use of opiates to escape from life. They really have some difficult life circumstances they want to get away from, even for a few hours. And there's no difference between those who started using doctor, uh, opiates from a doctor's prescription and those who experimented with drugs. So again, you've got the, these underlying depression and anxiety uh, that people feel that they are actually now self-treating this. And I think as we look toward prevention and we look toward uh, treatment, which you'll hear a lot more about later today, we've got to consider this unanticipated effect because this becomes the driver after a while. The high is very elusive. It's hard to, it's hard to uh, replicate in subsequent taking of the drug. What's driving it is this sense that you can feel some sort of relief from your worries and be, be, uh, be something you aren't really. My best example of that, I have a few here, uh, mask inside emotions, traumas, feelings of fear, self-esteem, self-pity, anger, and avoiding the growing stress and responsibility of life. This was a woman uh, speaking to us. It made me feel happy and gave me the energy and want to do daily activities such as working that otherwise wouldn't have been possible due to the debilitating depression at that time of my life. My story that probably best describes what, what you're going through is a young man was in my office, about 19, 20 years old, really good looking uh, young man, looked like an all-American type kid, played a lot of sports, but he was a heroin addict. And I said, well, why are you taking heroin? He said, well, I'm a very shy person. And he was quite shy. I'm very uh, reserved and I don't, I can't talk to people because I don't think they'll like me very much because I'm not really all that good a person. I don't talk that well and I just, they're disinterested in me, especially girls. If I see girls at a bar or a party and try to approach him, if she's a hot girl, I, I would never do that because what about rejection? I would be rejected by someone and they just could not stomach that rejection. And I said, well, you know, you're that individual. And he said, well, I'm sorry, his connection was, I take drugs, when I take drugs, I don't feel these effects at all. I'm outgoing, people love me. I'm at a life of the party, I see a girl, walk up to her, pick her up, we leave the party together, it's wonderful. It's, it absolutely makes me a better person. And I kept trying to say to them, you're a good person inherently, uh, as, it, as it is. The drug is just some sort of artificial convenience that you use to get out of it, but don't you understand this is you people like. They like you inside, you just covered it up with some situations and he said, Doc, you know, I believe you and I understand what you're saying, but I sincerely do believe that I will uh, stay on opiates because I am a better person. Now that's a person with so uh, low self-esteem and so, I mean, he basically told me as he left my office, he was going, going to go find some drugs, which is a terrible thing when you think about these younger people especially feeling that they're so worthless, you know, that opiates for some reason help them overcome their, their depression and make them outgoing. Very serious issue, and again, this gives you an idea of the complexity of this disorder we're looking at. We're not just talking about getting high anymore, we're talking about people who are using this to feel better, and actually many people report to us that I feel normal when I'm on opiates. And that's a very serious issue we have to take up in a very uh, discreet way. Uh, confronting the epidemic, what did we do uh, with this epidemic, because it became rampant. Uh, you scarcely couldn't turn on the news back uh, five or six years ago and not hear something about prescription opiate abuse. It was prevalent uh, throughout. So what do we do? We focused on the supply side efforts because that's something we can do relatively easily. And what does that mean? There's our prescription monitoring programs. Uh, we are only one of the 49 states, or 50 states, there's 49, uh, that have a prescription monitoring program statewide. We do not have that. It's been held up in legislation for quite some time. Uh, the governor's effort is a little bit different than a prescription monitoring program. And you heard from the mayor that the, the city and the county have joined in an effort, at least at the local level, to have sort of a prescription monitoring program. What these programs do is allow a physician to type in a, a patient's name, go into a database and see whether that patient has seen multiple doctors, whether that patient has filled multiple prescriptions at different pharmacies. Extremely important information because it helps the doctor establish whether or not he's being scammed. And most physicians don't know that they're being scammed or not, and they can't use these databases to see if the patient is someone they should be cautious with. Uh, they crack down on pill mills. There are lots and lots, of, especially in Florida, there are a lot of clinics that exist simply to write out uh, prescriptions for physicians as, or I'm sorry, for people waiting in line as they come in. And you can recognize what they are. If you go to Florida, you can see people lined up around the block. And as long as the law is very fuzzy in Florida, as long as you see a doctor, and the doctor says, do you have pain? Uh, that constitutes a visit. And at that point, he can write a prescription. 
five dollars is the normal cost. These guys can make five or six hundred thousand a year. They're shutting these down uh, progressively, but they're popping up in other states as well. So, but there has been a real big crackdown on, on the pill mills. A lot of physician education. I think you heard from the dean this morning. Uh, the typical medical school curriculum doesn't really focus on pain management very well, and doesn't certainly focus on the use of opiates appropriately in this. We, it, there's so much to learn in medical school that has always been a very subunit of some, some course. It needs to be given a much higher profile, and I'm glad to see that's, that's being done. The last one is the abuse deterrent formulations. As I mentioned at the beginning of my, my uh, talk, uh, addicts love to crush these pills up because then they can snort them or you can easily solubilize them and inject them into your, into your veins. Uh, that's the first step they take to uh, taking a pill. They rarely take them orally because they don't get that much of a buzz, so they actually crush them up a little bit. So all of the abuse deterrent formulations went to work to see if they could prevent that crushing or that solubilization uh, of the pill. Uh, I'm going to just want to talk about the impact of abuse deterrent formulations first. Uh, it's primary focus of all of these. these or we spend a lot of money, drug companies have spent a lot of money uh, on this issue. Uh, the effects of ADS on abuse for OxyContin, uh, one of the most widely abused, as I mentioned at the beginning, has been modestly successful in reducing abuse by non oral routes. Opana, oxymorphone, a little less effective. Embedda is probably the least effective, but at least there, there are attempts. Did they work? The question is yes, they have worked. There has been a decrease in the use of prescription opioids. Unfortunately, there are always in life anticipated and unanticipated effects. And one of the unanticipated effects is that people weren't just going to stop using opioids once you made their, their favorite drug abuse deterrent. They were going to find some way either to get around it or they would switch to another drug. It seems to be an obvious conclusion in retrospect that someone should have thought about that. Uh, before the, this whole effort uh, was underway. The unanticipated effect is, if you look at the left bar there, we asked the p people who had been on OxyContin, normal OxyContin or OxyContin, uh, uh, the, the re, uh, extended release version that was abuse deterrent, 70% of those people turned to heroin. They could not find a drug that would do as good as OxyCodone did uh, and it was too much effort to try to get into the abuse deterrent formulation. So that was a good outcome because we didn't want them to get it into the abuse determination. But we didn't figure out that most of those people were going to switch to another drug. And this is what started the heroin crisis. And I think we, we have to recognize that's what we're in right now. Prescription abuse is, is an issue. Uh, heroin abuse has become an even bigger one. And it, for obvious reasons that I'll get to. And the reasons they're given here, because of the change in the OxyContin formulation, I tried heroin for the first time. I did that in part because you couldn't smoke or snort the OxyContin pills anymore, so I resorted to something you could do that with. The factors that favor the use of, of, of heroin are heroin is much cheaper now on the marketplace than is a, a prescription drug. You may pay $80 for an OxyContin tablet, whereas you can get a, a dime bag of heroin for 5 or $10 now. now you got worries about its purity and all that. But it's easy to get, it's easier to inject, obviously, than it is, and it's purer than ever. Problem is, these young addicts that were using prescription drugs knew their dose all the time by looking at the pill. Now somebody gave them powder, and they don't know what dose to take because it's not marked, clearly. So they end up taking the, the, a dose of heroin. They may have guessed right, or they may have guessed wrong. But this is a guessing game at this point. And that's why you're seeing so many overdoses, they guessed wrong. And they went with uh, uh, far too many of them. You can see what's happened over the years. Um, prescription opiate, the, the line in blue, has been, this is based on 12,000 people. If you're looking at the uh, people using prescription opioids, it was very high in 2011, 2012. But you can see a nice gradual decrease in the number of people using prescription opioids. If you look at heroin, on the other hand, you see a mirror image. But you see that heroin is increasing at the same time until the last year for which we have data is 2016. They're now about equally uh, well used compared to, say, in 2011 when heroin was you know, really a minority drug at that point. There's also good evidence of reduced uh, stigma. Every single person I know that, that used pills now uses heroin. Also, every person I know that now uses heroin uses it intravenously. More people that I can count who I never thought would even try it, heroin are now shooting it up. Again, a very serious, when you get starting to injecting drugs or snorting, but injecting especially, you've got bloodborne pathogens to worry about, sharing needles, you've got all these hepatitis C 
We've got all of these potential factors that could create a medical nightmare. Uh, just another quote, basically, I, the focus on the last paragraph. I had access to money because I'm an upper middle class family, and I also became close to my dealers driving them around. So you get paid in drugs, you're just becoming super close, even if it meant sexually, so you get the drug I needed. Again, the, the focus here is, I think you need to realize that the inner city still has a problem with opiate. Not, let's not minimize that. But we're now seeing a, pro progression, a progression, actually, in the use of the drug now out in the suburbs and rural areas, where kids are even less experienced uh, with these medications. But they're able to get them rather easily through a dealer now. And it's not the typical dealer who hangs out on a, a corner in some dark place. These are people that he may even know, friends or, or, or others. The whole change of demographics, we now have a population of people that weren't using opioids before. We haven't stamped out the opiate problem in inner cities for sure, but we now have a problem that's spread into the suburbs and rural areas. That has got people's attention. And that's what shows up on the 10 o'clock news. You can be cynical about this, but unfortunately that makes news when a, a white football player is found in a parking lot of, of Target uh, with a needle hanging out of his arm. That makes news because it, it is, it's hitting next door now for the first time. Changing drug, uh, over 75% of heroin users in the past few years resided in suburban and rural areas. That's a remarkable statistic compared to back into the 60s and 70s. That, that wasn't the case back then. Previous heroin users tended to be young minority males living in an urban center. The new heroin user, in addition to that group, is now older white male and females living in suburban or rural areas. I guess they want me to leave. <laughs> that place that children are. I know how to get out of here, believe me. Uh, one, one last point, and I know I should stop. I don't, I don't know what time I've got left. Uh, heroin is first opioid abuse. This is the most scary part of my talk, and I'm sorry I have to sort of end with it. But this is people who are opiate naive. They've never had a prescription opiate. They've never had heroin. Now, if you look just in the last few years, these are people whose first opiate they tried was heroin. That's a frightening development. These are opiate-naive individuals who have no tolerance built up to so, uh, taking these medications. They're now sampling it because it's so readily available. These are the kids, and you'll see the uh, depiction of it here. Look at the suicide or the uh, overdose deaths compared to the uh, use of uh, the first use of opiate by uh, heroin addicts. They're parallel curves. They're almost indistinguishable uh, from one another. It's predictable. This is people who are opiate naive who are just introduced to heroin. They're taking a guess at what the dose is and they miscalculate. Very simple thing to happen. This to me is extremely frightening as is the addition of fentanyl which is popping up in almost every heroin batch has some fentanyl now. It's always safest to assume that. And even worse is car fentanyl which is actually a much more potent. It's 10,000 times more potent than morphine. This is used to tranquilize elephants. It's now in heroin uh, on a ready basis, and that's, this is what's killing people now, are the additives as well as the heroin. So we've got a problem with this, and most of this is being synthesized in China. It's been being shipped to Canada, and for very arcane reasons that it, get, it gets through the system, and then even to New Mexico, and then it's imported from our, from our borders. So we have a serious, serious, serious problem that has evolved from a relatively simple, straightforward use of prescription opioids. We're now looking at heroin. We're now looking at fentanyl and its analogs, which is a very, when you've got a drug that's 50,000 times more potent than uh, morphine, that's a dangerous, dangerous drug. How are you going to titrate that dose effectively unless you know the facts and know what to do with it? That, I think, is what's contributing to the overdose deaths we're seeing. So we have a, a big problem. I think we need much more in the way of prevention, which you'll, you'll hear a little bit about it. We need to stop this in its tracks if, uh, the, best not, the best we can. The other is we have to enhance treatment efforts to get these people off these medications. There's better ways of treating anxiety and depression than taking opiates. That's straightforward for all of us, but for a lot of these, these younger people especially, they have to understand. Treat the whole person. Just don't treat the drug abuse issue, but treat the whole person. This person has inherent issues that opiates make them feel better. We've got to in some way uh, start addressing that. Uh, with that, I think I'll close. It's hard to know if I'm time or not. I guess we don't have time. I don't know. No one knows. 9.40. We were supposed to be done at 9.30. All right. All right. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cicero. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Thanks for giving us that great overall view of what we're talking about today, about the opioid epidemic. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, and we break it down a little bit more into to different topics to talk about, uh, we want to do another polling question. So this question is, how many people in your community do you know who have died due to, does that sound familiar? Did we just do this one? A little bit different, okay. How many people in your community do you know who have died due to opioid use? One, none, two, one, three, two to five, four, too many to count. Uh, to join in the live polling sessions, text your response to 587-316-3408 or go online to tallyspace.com slash vote slash 8117. Now let's talk about uh, the law enforcement response to the opioid epidemic. Our next speaker is Jim Schroba. He's the special agent in charge of the St. Louis Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration for the Justice Department. It has 18 facilities throughout Missouri, Southern Illinois, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. Mr. Schroba oversees the investigative and enforcement strategies of the St. Louis Division. His career with the DEA spans more than two decades and includes a variety of investigative and leadership assignments in both DEA offices in the United States and abroad. So please join me in welcoming Jim Schroba to give us a state of the state of law enforcement. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm honored to be here representing not only the Drug Enforcement Administration, but law enforcement throughout the state of Missouri. At a time when overdose death rates are at catastrophic levels, let me be clear, DEA's top priority, not one of our priorities, but our top priority is addressing the abuse of opioids and opioid trafficking through the pursuit of criminal organizations who are distributing their poison to American neighborhoods like St. Louis. Organized crime groups, many of them that are based outside of the United States, are capable of producing seemingly limitless quantities of heroin and fentanyl analogs. And they're adept, excuse me, adept at concealing their international shipments by using web-based sales and cryptocurrency transactions. In a minute, I'll touch on the alarming availability of fentanyl, but for the moment, I'd like to discuss briefly how we got here. Heroin abuse in the 1970s was limited to um, urban, primarily re um, minority residents, uh, typically around the age of 28 to 30. The cost per kilogram, the cost per dosage units were exceptionally high, which resulted in purity levels that averaged around 4%. In 2007, this is the, the onset of this crisis here in the St. Louis metropolitan area, certainly not the case nationwide, but in this area. We began to see a heroin crisis emerge that was fueled primarily by a generation of prescription opioid abusers opioid abusers that have an insatiable appetite. Cartels, as I said, most of them based south of our border or in places like Asia, recognize this insatiable appetite and they postulated very early on that eventually Opioid abuse, prescription opioid abusers would not be able to afford the $1 per milligram cost. Or as Dr. Cicero said, $80 for an 80 milligram tablet. So they ramped up production of opium poppy in places like Mexico and South America. 
As a result, they flooded the streets of places like St. Louis, Missouri with ultra high purity heroin, suppressed prices, and as you'll see in 2007, or excuse me, 2017, the average purity of heroin on the streets of St. Louis. Now, this is, this is individual dosage units at $10 a button is 45% pure. The distinction I want to make here is that at 45% pure or higher, for the first time user, you eliminate the stigma of the needle. This is how, and this is a concerted effort on the part of organized crime groups to raise the purity high enough, get people hooked because they don't have to use the needle, but make no mistake, as we'll see shortly, it's almost like a placebo. Very, short, very, very soon after beginning their addiction, they will, they will switch to the needle. But there's a dark cloud that hangs over all of what I just said. And that dark cloud is that there are an estimated six million or more, I think this is a low estimate, six million or more prescription opioid abusers. Where are they gonna go when they can't get those opioids? They're gonna turn to heroin, of course, and just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, when opioid, when heroin-related overdose deaths were rising dramatically, it got much worse. You've heard Dr. Cicero talk about this. Fentanyl trafficking organizations and their criminal associates represent one of the most significant drug threats facing our country. Overseas organized crime groups are capable of producing nearly any synthetic drug imaginable to include fentanyl. The alarming trend looks like that. The tragic result plays out every day in communities across this country, but you can see for yourself what it looks like in the state, in the, in the St. Louis metropolitan area. The CDC estimates that there are 20,000 Americans who lost their lives in 2016 to fentanyl overdoses. That's 20,000 of the 64,000 people that died of a drug overdose last year. If you look at the red trend line here, you can see that fentanyl-only overdose deaths in the St. Louis metropolitan area far surpassed heroin. And for this year, they're rising even at a more dramatic rate. So fentanyl is sold uh, in many forms in the United States, all of which, all of which are potentially fatal. Pure fentanyl, fentanyl mixed with heroin, Cocaine, and yes, even marijuana, has been seized by law enforcement, in particular DEA, not just in this metropolitan area, but across the United States. Oftentimes it's pressed into pills. And pills are fold, some, often sold falsely as prescription opioid drugs. Users often, often have no idea what they're getting. They don't know about the purity and they don't have any idea what's inside the pill. And that's one of the reasons why, as we've seen in the previous slide, it proved so deadly. Fentanyl distributors, many of whom are based in Asia, are using the internet to sell fentanyl directly to US customers. They're using multiple identities to conceal their true location and obscure the trail of profits. It's an incredible challenge for law enforcement. They take advantage of the fact that the fentanyl molecule can be altered in numerous ways to create an analog that is not yet listed as illegal under US law. First bullet point here, um, purity levels range from 0.07% to 4%. A fatal dose is approximately two, uh, two milligrams of pure fentanyl. what's taking place in the state of Missouri with fentanyl. This is just one example, one case, but I, I illustrate it for its dramatic effect, you might say. 27 kilograms of fentanyl, seized earlier this year in April, 
at two milligrams a dose, that's enough fentanyl in one seizure to kill every resident in the state of Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, South Dakota, with enough left over for half of Nebraska. One seizure, destined for St. Louis, not going anywhere else, gonna be trafficked here. It's not all doom and gloom. Some of the things that DEA are doing in, in part of our response is the DEA 360 strategy. It's DEA's, it's DEA's call to action. As a law enforcement agency, DEA remains steadfast and aggressively aggressively targeting criminal organizations that perpetuate the epidemic. But the issue of opioid abuse is both complex and requires collective efforts, not just of law enforcement, but from families, communities, educators, healthcare and treatment providers. The 2016 CDC Statistics show synthetic opioids are the leading driver of overdose deaths in the United States. In addition, the same data estimates that more than 64,000 Americans died as a result of a drug overdose last year alone. So even though we throw out these numbers of overdose deaths frequently, I've, I've done it many times here, I fear that the American public has only a, a general understanding of the true nature of this crisis. Whenever I tell an audience that 64,000 people died of a drug overdose last year, it's a statistic that most of them struggle to comprehend, and they should. I challenge all of us, I challenge all of us to look beyond the statistics and instead focus on the individuals behind those numbers. Part of the solution related to unnecessary loss of lives has to come from discussions, which can be difficult and uncomfortable, as they should be. But I remind everyone that each of those deaths impacts real people, from the immediate victim to all those whose life they touched. Some of the more proactive things that we're doing. Many of you may be familiar with DEA's National Take Back Program, started in 2010. That's one way DEA seeks to rebu reduce abuse and the risk of abuse by reducing the availability of controlled prescription drugs. All of you know that four out of five, four out of every five heroin abusers report that their addiction started with prescription opioids. Half, one half of all of those individuals state that they acquired the pills free of charge, free of charge from the medicine cabinet of a family member or friend. That's us. This past October, law enforcement agencies across the metropolitan area collected in our metropolitan area, collected 37,000 pounds, that's not a typo, of unused, expired, or unwanted prescription drugs. That's an astounding figure. But we have a lot more work to do, and DEA wants to partner with all of you to get it done. By the way, a footnote. I'd like to point out nine million pounds, nine million pounds since we started this program. That's a statistic that I have a hard time wrapping my head around. Another example of DEA's efforts is the partnership of, between DEA and the Discovery Channel, Discovery Education. You can see the website link here, Operation Prevention. It is uh, launched in 2015. It's a program um, that designs a curriculum 
for K through 12 students, and it's designed to kickstart life starting, uh, life changing conversations about opioid abuse. It's a STEM based program presented in both English and Spanish, and it's aligned with uh, all the K through 12 tools currently being taught to more than one million students across the country. We'd love to see this integrated into schools across the nation. These are just a few of the organizations that DEA has partnered with, important partnerships. I would love to see a time come when my presentation is filled with slides like this, but, we, but you should know that you have a partner in DEA and we want to expand our partnerships and what we can do in outreach to the community. Together we have a shared responsibility to educate the public by making sure the message is clear. The path of opioid abuse once taken all too often ends tragically. I know that you agree that we can't continue on this path. In closing, I would like to thank Dr. Randall Williams and everyone at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. The tireless efforts of these individuals and, and all of you are the reason why we're here today and our collect collective efforts make this nation safer. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for those sobering numbers. Uh, let's take a look now at the, what's called Generation RX. Look at some of the pharmacies, some of the prescription angles here. Uh, joining us to talk about that is Amy Tmeyer. She's an associate professor of pharmacy practice at St. Louis College of Pharmacy. She is director of community partnerships and Associate Director of the Office of Experiential Education. Uh, Dr. T. Meyer received her bachelor's and doctor of pharmacy degrees at the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. And she calls the role of pharmacists vital in the fight against drug abuse, saying the pharmacy counter is a prime place for pharmacists to educate medication recipients. Dr. T. Meyer is also an advisor to the St. Louis County Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, which as we heard covers about 70% of the state's population through 54 participating cities and counties. So please join me in welcoming Dr. T. Meyer. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It's been a very sobering morning thus far. Um, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes giving you maybe some tools that will help you take action in this. Um, I recognize that you're all here in a professional capacity and there's many touch points today that you'll um, connect with on a professional level and in your professional roles. But I'd also like you to think as I get started about your communities and where you're involved. So the organizations that you're involved with, um, the people that you interact with on a regular basis, um, your kids, where they go to school, the activities that they're involved in, um, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, different sports teams. Um, this is something, as I talk about the Generation RX program and materials, that these are things that are created to assist you in being involved in your communities. Right? So as we're talking about the spectrum of this issue, um, one thing that NCAA I know will talk about is that we will never solve this if we are not doing a lot of work on the prevention side. And each of us in our own communities getting involved, caring about the people that we interact with on a weekly and daily basis is part of what will help to resolve this issue. And this is just one tool, just like the operation prevention materials that were just mentioned, that will help to address this issue. So I'll give you just a little bit of an overview. Sorry, I'm used to wandering with my students. I can't do that. Um, I don't have a microphone, so I'll, st I'll stick behind here. Um, we'll talk about an overview of what Generation RX is and highlight some of the educational materials that are available um, and how pharmacists can help you and the Missouri Pharmacy Association can be involved in helping you with this. 
Okay. So Generation RX is a program. This is a program that is funded um, and created by Car the Cardinal Health Foundation as well as the Ohio State University back in 2009. And their four main goals are prevention education, drug take, take back, community collaborations, and best practices in pain management. They again are wanting to take a proactive preventative approach to the issues that we're seeing. What I'm going to focus on today is the prevention education piece of what they've done. So for the prevention ed education, they have free ready to use resources that focus on medication safety education for all ages at generationrx.org. Again, free resources, you download them. If you need to modify them to fit your situation, that is possible. They just want to make sure that you have the resources needed. They developed all of these resources with prevention specialists and education specialists. So this is not just something thrown together um, that you know were some good ideas, but they've really done a good job of vetting and developing these things to be appropriate for all the different constituents that they are um, trying to reach with these materials. So they have created toolkits for a variety of different groups. So first is elementary school age. Next would be your middle school and high school age, your preteens and your teens. Adults, college age students, we know that that's a huge issue. Patients, the workforce, and our elderly community. Okay, these are all people who are being impact impacted by this crisis um, in various different ways and the, the differences in um, what the issues are for each of those groups vary, and so they've really wanted to create materials that would um, address specifically the issues that those populations are dealing with and the, the factors that we know are impacting the use and misuse of medications in those populations. The key messages that they focus on across the board, they've got four key messages. So only using prescription medications as directed by healthcare professionals, we know that there is there are legitimate, reasonable uses for these medications. We can't just get rid of them, but we want to make sure they're being used properly. Not sharing or taking someone else's medication. We know that this happens, and we want to stop that. Keeping medications safe with proper storage and disposal, and then modeling safe medication practices. So here's just some of the examples of the materials that are available, again, at no cost on the website. Um, one thing to note on the left side of the screen there is that for every set of materials for every age group or population, there's a facilitator guide. So if you're wanting to go in but you're like, I'm not really sure, I'm not much of a presentation person, they really walk you through and give you the details, give you some of the specifics so that you can feel more comfortable doing these activities and these presentations for your community. They've also got a number of different slides. They've got some take-home uh, things that can be printed out. Again, it's, it's a whole package designed for you to take and utilize in your communities. Um, I think probably one of our most vulnerable populations and the place where we need to put a lot of our effort is with our youth. Um, if we can, we can support them and protect them and get them in a good place um, as youth, many times will prevent a lot of these issues going forward. Um, and so what we, they have is uh, materials for elementary education as well as for teens. So one thing um, important to note for elementary education is that there is no mention of misuse or abuse. Sometimes people get alarmed thinking, I don't want you teaching my kindergartner about misuse of medications. They're not doing that. They're really providing a foundational framework of the appropriate concept of medication and how it should be used. So what is a medication? How do you use it safely? They do a lot of learning through games and activities. If any of you have kids, they're not going to listen to you just talk. You have to do it through games, songs, activities, and that's exactly what they've developed here. Once you get into the teen education focus, then it shifts. Again, we know that that's the prime age for experimentation. Peer pressure is incredibly high. And so they do start focusing on what is misuse? What does that look like? And how do you use medications safely? Um, they practice a lot. They've actually got scenarios and um, activities designed for students to practice how do you turn down an invitation to misuse? Again, peer pressure is incredibly high. If you put a student in this, or a teen in a situation where they um, are suddenly faced with this issue and they haven't thought through how to turn it down before, 
they're much more likely to go ahead and take that invitation to misuse or to try or experiment. So by giving them opportunities to practice ahead of time, to have those phrases ready to go in those situations, makes them that much more comfortable and much more able to turn down those invitations. Learning alternative ways to handle stress. Many times it's related to stress, and we're seeing more and more stress on our young people. And then again, learning through games and activities. This is not just me sitting up there lecturing to students or whoever that is, but really to involve them and engage them. For the elementary education resources, again, they've got a facilitator guide. They've got a variety of different activity stations and games and worksheets. Um, they've got letters to parents and visual aids. You can take any of these pieces. It's not something that has to be a full-blown blown program. You can take any piece. You could go in and just do a game in a classroom with your kids, um, you know, with your child's classroom. It could be much bigger, like a school assembly. It's, it's very flexible. Again, they have, you know, cute little people on there and talking about, again, good choices and bad choices, which is really appropriate at that elementary age, um, giving them a little bit of information. So we do want them to understand what does a prescription label look like and what's the information on there so that they're starting to understand that, again, giving them that positive foundational framework about medication to start with. Again, the teen resources, again, there's a facilitator guide here. Many of us, I think, maybe feel nervous about interacting with that particular age group, but again, they walk you through very nicely on that facilitator guide. There's some interactive presentations. They've got a family feud type game, some skit-based activities, um, and again, really working through how do they handle the peer pressure aspect of um, medication misuse. Here's just another, some, uh, some other pictures of what um, they do. So this scene too is again something that can be handed out. They'll do a little plot twist. How does this play in? Um, again, giving them those opportunities to practice, get their phrases down about why they are going to turn down the offer to misuse medications. So pharmacists can help. Um, I'm here representing not only the College of Pharmacy but the Missouri Pharmacy Association. and. We are medication experts. We get lots of years um, learning about drugs and medications, um, and the Missouri Pharmacy Association wants to help. So we are providing expertise for coalitions and task force, and educating in schools and community organizations and things like that. Um, if you would like some help, so certainly you can take all of these materials, you can use them um, as they are, but if that's not quite your wheelhouse, if you want a little bit of assistance, uh, things like that, we are offering that you can contact the Missouri Pharmacy Association, contact our CEO, Ron Fitzwater. Um, he will find a pharmacist in your area. That might be me, but I can't do them all. Um, but that we can really put you in contact with a pharmacist who, who can help and who can go into the, the schools and the communities. Um, it's something that I've tried to do. We also have a Generation Rx student chapter here at the College of Pharmacy, literally right next door. So we've got students who are interested in getting involved in presenting these messages, providing education in schools and things like that. So again, I'd like you to think back to those organizations those groups that you thought about that you're involved with, even your book clubs, um, your neighborhood organizations, those are the places where you can take these messages, again, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, all those things. I think if you offer to do a presentation or talk about this issue because it's such a hot topic, you'll actually be pretty warmly greeted and they'll want you to come, okay? So please um, Think about that. Think again about being involved in your communities, being a real um, important part of the prevention piece where you are and where you live, in addition to all your amazing professional roles as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. T. Meyer. Those are good resources that many of us didn't know about, so thank you very much. Uh, before we get to uh, our next speaker, it's time to do uh, another polling question, and you'll be seeing it come up on the screen shortly. Uh, this question asks, how confident are you at identifying places and resources for treatment for opi opioid addiction? How confident are you at identifying places or resources for treatment for opioid addiction. One, very confident. Two, somewhat confident. Three, not confident at all. 
So either texture response 2587, 316, 3408, or go online at tallyspace.com slash vote slash 8117. And we'll have the results of these three questions coming up when we, um, during the break, which is not too far away. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the way forward, awareness and prevention. Uh, Nicole Dawsey is Director of Prevention Education at the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse in St. Louis. The NCADA works to prevent or reduce the harms of alcohol and other drug use through education, intervention, and advocacy. Nicole has said that nine out of 10 people needing treatment don't get it, which she calls, and I think we agree, totally unacceptable. So please welcome to the podium, Nicole Dossey. Good morning. So I recognize I'm the only thing that's standing between you and a much deserved break, but I please ask that you bear with me. I also will ask that you bear with me for a moment while I start off with a poem. And if you know me, you know that I'm not really a poetry kind of gal, but I think you'll understand why this poem um, seems to have be ri been written for exactly this moment in time. This poem is called The Fence and the Ambulance, and some of you might be familiar with it. Twas a dangerous cliff, as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant. But over its terrible edge there had slipped a duke and full many a peasant. So the people said something would have to be done, but their projects did not tally. Some said put a fence around the edge of the cliff, some an ambulance down in the valley. But the cry for the ambulance carried the day, for it spread through the neighboring city. A fence may be useful or not, it is true, but each heart became so brimful of pity for those who had slipped over that dangerous cliff. And the dwellers in highway and alley gave pounds or gave pence not to put up a fence, but an ambulance down in the valley. Then an old sage remarked, it's a marvel to me that people give far more attention to repairing the harm than to stopping the cause when they'd much better aim at prevention. Let us stop at its source all this mischief, cried he. Come neighbors and friends, let us rally. If the cliff we will fence, we must also dispense with the ambulance down in the valley. Better guide well the young than reclaim them when old, for the voice of true wisdom is calling. To rescue the fallen is good, but tis best to prevent other people from falling. Yes. Now hold your applause because I did not write this, but this, <laughs> I wish. But this poem was written in 1895 by Joseph Malins. And as you can see, prevention has long been recognized as an essential and sensible part of the way forward. In fact, when Joseph Malins wrote this poem in 1895, then, as is now, more emphasis was being placed on putting that ambulance down in the valley than putting that fence up to prevent those from falling. And when that poem was written in 1895, I don't know if you know this, but America was in the throes of a pretty terrible opium addiction an opiate epidemic swept the nation because in the years after the Civil War, we had thousands upon thousands of veterans returning addicted to morphine and we had wealthy society ladies who were addicted to laudanum, which was a alcohol and opium tincture that worked as a cough suppressant. So in 1895, um, that same year that that poem was written, that was also the year that Bayer invented a painkiller better than aspirin, and it turned out to be a fantastic cough suppressant, even better than laudanum. Best of all, after five years of study, the prestigious Boston Medical and Surgical Journal declared that it was not a hypnotic, there was no danger of acquiring a habit, 
And in fact, using Bayer's new drug was actually recommended as a safe way for morphine, morphine addicts to kick their habit. You all know where I'm going with this. That wonder drug was heroin, and as it turned out, the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal was wrong, way wrong. The country's first encounter with opiates beginning in a, it began in a serious way around 1860, and it was devastating. It affected far more people than the crack epidemic in 1980s and 1990s, and it continued for 45 years. A huge part of the solution back then came from government. So we began taxing and regulating opium. Um, we made smoking it illegal. Um, enforcement was huge. And actually, a lot of doctors went to jail for misprescribing opiates. So doctors began prescribing opiates very cautiously, very carefully, prescribing them only after surgery, in acute emergencies, and for end-of-life care. And that's why really up until the start of the century, while people misused heroin and other opiates, the breadth and depth of this problem was much, much more limited. So 100 years later, the exact same ha thing happened again. A short letter appeared in a, another Boston Medical journal, journal. The manufacturer of Oxycontin declared that it was safe and not addictive. They made a fortune. And here we are today, December 5th, 2017. The news you've heard this morning has been kind of depressing. So we've heard from Jim that we can't really arrest our way out. We've heard that treatment works and recovery is possible, but we know we're never going to be able to treat our way out of this problem. It's a long road back. So if we can't arrest our way out and we can't treat our way out, what do we do? The DEA, as you just heard, is embarking on an amazing 360 strategy. And I'm happy to report that last year they made our Super Bowl ads possible. They're doing it again this year. Very exciting for us. So that's one example of partnership where we have enforcement, treatment, that we are not, but we work with other treatment folks, and prevention all working together. The way forward is not arresting our way out. It's not treating our way out. The way forward is prevention, and you've heard some of that already with the GenRx program, great program. We know that it makes sense, it's common sense, to put a fence around the cliff to, people, to keep people from falling. We know this. So let's focus on real prevention. What does real prevention look like? There's an axiom in the world of prevention that says that in order to prevent the occurrence of a disease, it's important to reach a large number of people at low risk, not just a small number of people at high risk. So let me say that again because sometimes that, that takes a while for people to understand, including myself. So in order to prevent the occurrence of a disease, we need to target a low number of people I'm sorry, a hot, see I told you, a high number of people, let me start over. <laughs> How, Howard's like in my ear and it's, so let me repeat this. In order to prevent the occurrence of a disease, it's important to reach a large number of people at low risk, not just a high, oh, you know what I'm saying, not just a small number of people at high risk. Here, let me put it into these words. You build a fence around the whole cliff, not just around the most treacherous parts. That makes the most sense, right? So we did this before. We eradicated polio not just by vaccinating some kids, but by all kids. It can happen to anybody. Rich, poor, white, black, urban, rural, it's the same with addiction. And while there is no Jonas Salk for addiction, there is 35 years of prevention science that tells us what doesn't work, what does work, and at a time when we need to try lots of different approaches, what is likely to work. So disease prevention works. For example, it's been estimated that we could reduce the incidence and prevalence of all cancer by 28% if we were able to fully deploy all of the known prevention strategies. Smoking cessation, diet, exercise. The numbers are much larger for a disease like melanoma, 
where there's an identified environmental cause. So doesn't it make more sense for us to improve our messaging about sun exposure or to put age and visit restrictions on tanning beds than to increase the number of disfiguring surgeries? That makes sense, right? So the question is especially relevant when there are limited resources to deal with the disease and we have to set priorities. And when it comes to reducing the prevalence of disease and addiction, we have limited resources. So for that reason, it is crucially important that we direct more of those resources to prevention, real prevention. Addiction isn't polio, but we can inoculate kids with the known pr protective factors that will insulate them from the likely risk factors that we know that they're gonna face later. Think about that. What if we give kids the tools, the resiliency skills, to withstand the toxic stress, the adverse childhood experiences, the pain that life is inevitably going to bring to them? You heard from Dr. Cicero that opiates can be almost irresistible to a minority of people who try them. How many of those could have been spared the misery of addiction had they felt better in their own skin? Had they found healthy ways of coping or managing their anxiety. What if they had developed other ways to deal? We don't have a painkiller problem in this nation. We have a pain problem. We don't know how to deal with pain. Life brings pain. Life stinks. It's hard sometimes. We live in a world where people self-diagnose themselves using WebMD where they walk into a doctor's office demanding a script because a commercial told them to ask their doctor if it's right for them. We believe that a pill, a drink, or a hit is going to be the fix for whatever ails us. And this is doable. We know that prevention works. Look at what we've done in tobacco. My public health friends should be patting yourselves on the back. We've done amazing work when it comes to tobacco. Smoking rates are at historic lows, and it's because of the prevention education that begins with pregnant moms and continues with kiddos throughout their youth. I was just with fifth graders yesterday talking about tobacco. They all know it's gross, and when, the second you pull out a pack of cigarettes, they go, yeah. That would have never happened 15 years ago. Under President Obama, Congress allocated $1 billion over the next two years to deal with the opiate problem. And that sounds like a lot, but hardly any of that is for prevention. And consider that the government directs $24 billion every year for HIV AIDS. So the $1 billion wasn't enough. So far, President Trump has done some, probably not enough. Although last week, he did just donate three months of his annual salary to be directed to the opiate crisis. It's $100,000, enough to do almost nothing. <laughs> So let's give some perspective on what would be required. Last year in the eastern region of Missouri, NCADA, my staff delivered prevention programming to nearly 80,000 kids in 200 different schools, grades kindergarten through 12. That sounds great, and it is, but it is not nearly enough because we didn't serve all kids. We spend about $2 million a year, or about half of our budget at NCADA, on school-based prevention programming. This is multi-week, multi-year programming, but we estimate that it would take about $5 million for us to reach all kids in the St. Louis region. But what if we could do that? What if we could reach all kids in all grades, in, our, in all schools in this region? If we could reduce cancer, by 28% by employing all the known protective prote prevention tactics, how much could we reduce prevention substance use? How much could we reduce that? By 30%? By 50%? Reducing the incidence and prevalence of substance use disorder by only 10% would be a game changer. It would affect individual health, but it would also affect community health. It would have measurable benefits with respect to economic development, poverty, unemployment, healthcare costs, the list goes on and on. Now, $5 million sounds like a lot, and trust me, it is. It is a rounding error for Purdue Pharma. And while government is not the answer for everything, consider that $5 million is .0001 of the Missouri State budget. That's three zeros before a one. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that that's virtually nothing. 
Consider what large-scale, comprehensive, evidence-informed prevention and public education campaigns have done, not just for smoking, but for highway safety, for texting and driving, for AIDS, for STDs. Now, the question many of you are going to be asking yourselves is how can we afford to spend more money on prevention? The real question we need to be asking is how can we afford not to? Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Before we take our break, we do want to hear from a former member of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen. She's now a state representative for the 82nd District in Missouri. Uh, Donna Berenger is going to tell us about some legislative efforts that are underway to deal with the opioid crisis in the state of Missouri. Donna. Thank you, Fred. I'm sorry to crash your summit, but I can't thank Melba Moore enough. I served on the health committee for six years, and I'm all about prevention. And as I stood in the back, I said, oh my gosh, look at all these people that could be helping people like myself in the legislature help move some of this preventive legislation. And so you need to know that we're there. You know, to know that people like myself, while I'm new state rep, I am looking at prevention and I am one of the people that introduced the legislation for the sunscreen in all the schools and that we talk about cancer in the schools and we have another state rep that made it illegal after the age of 18 to use a, a tanning bed. So the reason I need to quickly say something to you all is because it's not as easy as you think from our end. And so while I pushed the CBD oil, which is cannabis oil, last year in the state legislature, I was doing it focused on the fact that my son suffered from seizures and had epilepsy as a child. And I, as a mother, should have the first choice of a cannabis oil before I had to go to narcotics. Now, let me flip that. In my office stood the people who came up to talk about opiates. In the midst of this, I explained, I was working on CBD oil, and a woman breaks down and starts crying in my office. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, do you not understand what has happened to me? She said, I got cancer of the mouth. I went through all these surgeries. I'm on chemo. And what do they prescribe to me, someone who is an addict? 30, 90 Oxycontin a month, three pills a day. She said, do I die of cancer or do I die of being an addict? Which do I choose? And I looked at her and I said, what about the CBD oil? And that's why she was crying. She said, I had to illegally get it from Oregon to get through chemo. And I said to her, that is why we need to make CBD oil available to people who don't want to take the opiates in this state. And so my legislation, House Bill 1441, increased the THC level, and you all are smart in this room because you're the public people, the, the, you know, the studious ones, not me. And we just, it's non-psychoactive. It is an option. It's to help the highest, let's say it again, what was the highest, the highest amount, no, the high, the most highest at the least, the biggest, amount at the biggest amount at the low risk. As soon as I heard that, I went, yes, that's why I did a fist bump when I got up here, because that's what I'm about, preventative. And I need you all to know that we're there. You can help us. Just one of the little things that one of the others said, I said, why not a zip pack? When you go in, when I get wisdom teeth, why are we giving a bottle that says take as needed? Why are we not doing a zip pack that says on Monday you can have this milligram, Tuesday this milligram, until it's gone and you get no more? So that's why. I want you all to know I'm Donna Berenger. I'm a state rep. I was a former city of St. Louis alderman, and I want to help with prevention as much as I can, and we're here. Get your ideas to us. Thank you. All right. So taking a look at the uh, first question we had, how many people in your community do you know have a problem with any kind of opioid? And the biggest response, uh, like 75 to 80 people said, too many to count. So I think that tells us something. So let's see what happens for the second question is how many people in your community do you know who have died due to opioid use? And pretty much the same number, uh, the leading response was none, followed pretty closely by two to five or too many to count. 
And the third polling question is how confident are you at identifying places and resources for treatment for opioid addiction? And uh, more than 100 people said somewhat confident. And hopefully after today, we can move people more into the very confident category after hearing everything that's being offered today. So thanks for doing the, taking part in the polls. It looks like a lot of you are participating. We're going to have, I think, one more question um, a little bit later on uh, today. Uh, right now, you know, right, right when we took the break, um, uh, the doctor from uh, the Washington University Emergency Department came up and said, hey, we haven't talked at all about emergency medical treatment. That's something we need to talk about. Well, luckily, it's what we've got scheduled next to talk about, talk about medication-assisted treatment and how it works. Uh, joining us to talk about that is Dr. Fred Rotnick. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Rotnick. He is professor and the director of community medicine at St. Louis University School of Medicine. He's also medical director of the physician assistant program at SLU. And he worked for 15 years in correctional health care, dealing with the health issues that may impact individuals upon reentry. Uh, Dr. Retnick is going to talk to us now about medical assisted treatment. He'll be back a little bit later to help facilitate, facilitate one of the panel discussions. But right now, let's uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Rotnick to the podium. Well, we've had lots of good mornings already. It's nice to see people are still here after the break because we're making a very intentional switch after the break today to talk about the experiences of people, families, and communities affected by addiction. Let's take a look here. Um, I am part of the Missouri State Targeted Opioid Response, which, which, which was mentioned um, in a previous speaker, where 76% of the funding is going to treatment for people with addictions. I am not arguing with anything said before today about the importance of things, like cutting off supplies, diversion, the importance of prevention. However, I am going to go a little off script here, and this is not endorsed by the Missouri team, so do not blame them. <laughs> when we talk about treatment, we need to talk about why is treatment important, why are medications important, why is harm reduction important. And it's important because we have fabulously failed our society in previous epidemics. If we think back to the crack epidemic, for example, not exclusively, but for example, we lost a whole generation of people because we allowed it to happen. We had people die with a disproportionate amount being black males in cities. We had people, we went through a period of hyper-incarceration that started in the 80s due to just say no, due to mandated minimums from legislatures, and due to war on drugs, which we all know didn't work. We went to hyper-incarceration. We saw our families and communities destroyed in our country, and we let it happen. This is a chance to do it right. And that's why I am not, I'm not saying again that prevention is not important, that cutting off supply is not important. But we cannot turn our backs on people who have addictions now. We cannot say with our limited resources that we cannot pay attention to our folks, our family members, and our communities who are dying. So that being said, let's move on. All right. Everything I really need to say today, and it's going to be so hard to stand still, is really in this slide. So take a little look at that while I let my blood pressure come down. <laughs> the bottom line, there are, more, there are medications we can use for people with addictions, and those give us more tools in our therapeutic therapeutic tool belt. If our Director of Adult Services for the Department of Mental Health were here today, she would say, in a delightful accent I will not try to mimic, people are dying. 
we can no longer have programs that we are comfortable with administering, that we are reimbursed for, that are not evidence-driven to dictate how we care for our people in our state. We need to take a look at what works, what are the best evidence-based practices, and we call that a medication-first model for people who need meds, and not everyone needs meds, but for those who need meds, we need to minimize the barriers for people getting into treatment so they can get into treatment faster, so their brain can stabilize. And then the last line there, if any of you say medication-assisted treatment is changing one addiction for another, talk to me later, because we don't have the time now, okay? We don't call insulin that, do we? Okay, we're gonna talk in a minute here about these meds. All right, my favorites, not my favorite, almost favorite slide. We're talking about right there. That's the synapse between two nerves. We're gonna talk about the chemistry that's going on in that space. You've heard about neurotransmitters, right? Neurotransmitters conduct the electrical impulses from one nerve to the next. And those things are done by where you have these little chemicals come in and they tag onto this, the receptors. Magical things happen, including we release dopamine when, and the dopamine is a drug that many of us have heard of. It's a drug, uh, it's a neurotransmitter of well-being, okay? We want good dopamine levels, okay? When we have good dopamine levels, we see, feel safe, we feel secure. The fancy word is euthymic. Everything's feeling the way it needs to feel. Well, I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute here. We're gonna skip this for a minute. This is my favorite slide, okay? And I'm a family doctor. I keep things simple, all right. We're, whoa, not that simple, okay. Right here. Every person in this room who's not on an opioid right now, if you took an opioid of any kind, prescription, heroin, fentanyl, whatever, assuming you're living, you're gonna bounce up and down between normal and euphoric, okay? Think of the y-axis here in this graph as mood, as dopamine levels, as something, okay? An opioid naive brain, which we've heard talked about today, is a brain that's not used to having exogenous or medication opioids in your brain. However, we know what happens in time is you go from going to normal euphoric to tolerance and dependence. This is normal. If you're taking opioids because you're in hospice care, if you're taking opioids for whatever reason, you're gonna see over time, and Dr. Cicero mentioned this today too, you're gonna be bouncing back and forth here where you're trying to stay out of this area of withdrawal, where your dopamine levels are low and you don't feel well. Again, kind of simple terms, but you kind of see what I'm after here. If we take a look at this next slide, chronic opioid use again, like we've talked about, okay? Here's where we have to personalize our treatments for our patients. Some people in time can stop using opioids on their own. Their chemistry regulates, their nervous system regulates, and they can, working with a therapist by doing talk therapy, can get into a point again of where their dopamine levels are good, they feel fine, they're normal, okay? What we're finding though is that depending on where you start with your addiction habits, your opioid use, your ability to move out of this into here may need some medications, okay? There's three medications we're gonna talk about in a little bit, but here, this is why I think it's really important to look at these graphs is because depending on where you were at the beginning of the previous graph, right here, when you started using things and you used over time, compare, let's say I started using heroin today. We know that an individual's brain doesn't mature until at least 25 or so, okay? We've known that for a while. It's not a secret, but we don't talk about it. Imagine if I have a 14-year-old up here who started drinking out of the liquor cabinet, who started using Grandma Betty's or Ann Hilda's pills out of the cabinet, who started buying button or pill form heroin on the playground, and they started using it 14, 15, 16, 17, 
We know their brains are not fully developed yet. Those of you who have teenagers can attest to that, okay? But we know that their brains are still plastic. Their neurochemistry hasn't been stabilized yet. Those kids, if they using, start using heroin at 17 versus me at 53, and believe me, I had patients at the jail who started using at 53, our brains are starting off at a different place. I might be able to stop with some meds and get my dopamine levels back to where they need to be in a year or two. Those kids at 15, 16, 17 may never get their brain chemistry back to a level that quote unquote is normal. Think to diabetes again, right? Some people do well with diet and exercise, oral meds, may even need insulin for a while, but they can reverse that. Some people with type 1 diabetics, juvenile diabetics we used to call them, adults that are past that, they're going to need insulin their whole life. And we don't call those people addicts, do we? We call them people who use insulin. Okay. All right. I get a little worked up about this. Okay, here are some. Let's go back to that other slide. Okay. All right. Great slide. I love a good slide. I'm such a geek. Okay, let's look at this side first. Mu receptors. These are receptors on our neurons right here. Okay, our neuron, nerve, nerve fiber, neurons, uh, receptors, okay? Mu receptors are the receptors where opioids plug in and create new impulses, cause dopamine release, all that stuff. We have three basic meds we use for opioid use disorder, for people with opioid addiction. These two over here are agonists, methadone and buprenorphine. Everybody's heard of methadone, been around since the 60s. Buprenorphine's been around for quite a while too, but we haven't utilized um, its use in opioid use disorder for as much as we can. These are synthetic opioids. Yes, I am up here and I just told you we're not substituting one addiction for another, but we'll get back to why. The third medication commonly used is naltrexone. Naltrexone, the way it works, it blocks the receptor. I could take naltrexone or the long-acting version, Vivitrol you may have heard of, 30-day depot formulation. I could use heroin today, I could take Percocet. I could drink alcohol, because the mu receptor works for alcohol as well. I would not get a euphoric response. I would not get a dopamine release from taking that. Those of you who may know someone on Vivitrol, if they have a glass of wine after they use Vivitrol, they're gonna get no euphoric effect because it's a blocker, it's an antagonist. Now these two meds are a little different. These two meds are opioid agonists. And you may say, why do we want to use opioid agonists for somebody who's got an addiction problem? The reason is we go back to, whoa. See, that, this is what teaches you when you go out of order. We're going back to our graphs here. We're talking about helping people get from here back to here, right? When your chemistry change and your neurological structure change, you need time for your nervous system to recover and calm down. Opioid agonists, which are meds that work like opioids, allow the body's chemistry to calm down, takes people out of high-risk environments like buying things from their corner pharmacists, not like Amy, but you know, you know what I mean, corner pharmacist. It's a joke, laugh, it's okay. Um, it keeps people out of sharing needles. It, keeps, it reduces the harm associated with opioid use when it's gained illicitly. And what it does, it also allows things like your, your receptors to downregulate to the normal phase so that when you are calmer, you're able to engage in therapy better. So, the ones we have, methadone, gold standard. It is an opioid, it's a synthetic opioid. It works great, but there are things that are problematic sometimes with, with methadone. One, you have to go to a methadone clinic. We talked about that today. How many are there in the state? 13 total in Missouri. So to be on chronic methadone maintenance for opioid use disorder, you have to be able to get to an opioid treatment program for the first at least 30 days, if not 90 days, every day to get your meds. We've got a lot of data, it's, it's efficacious, but it's also a true opioid, so you can overdose on it, okay? It's got the biggest dopamine push. 
So remember when I talked about the kid who might have started really early on and brain's not working well and may never? That kid might need methadone at some point, but we'll see. Buprenorphine is a medication we're talking a lot about, particularly with the opioid state targeted response work. Why? We won't get into all the pharmacology here, and I know you're all disappointed to hear that, but it's a very cool drug. It's considered a partial agonist because it has a ceiling effect in terms of its opioid effect. It's very difficult to overdose on buprenorphine by itself. If you're using other drugs with it, you can do that. Research shows it works, it works well in community-based practices. And we talked about waiver training before. We talked about um, what do you need in order to prescribe some of these meds. Any board eligible or board certified physician can take a training course that's eight hours in order to prescribe buprenorphine in their practice. You don't have to go to a special place to do it. What we have to do is get more people taking, those, taking that and getting comfortable prescribing, which is part of the work of our team. The last one we'll look, oh, I think I skipped one. Naltrexone. Naltrexone, that's the antagonist. That's the one that I said blocks the receptor. You take naltrexone, you don't get the euphoric effect from the medication. It works really well in some categories for people that have already gotten the opioid out of their system. Chad's gonna talk about Narcan here in a little bit, and Narcan Rescue, you, you're familiar with Narcan, that's the one our first responders have that do the opioid reversal and saves hundreds of lives in our area. This is kind of a long acting version of that. It works great if you already have the opioids out of your system. It works, so think about people coming out of jail or prison, think about people coming out of a longer term detox, and it works really well for some of those folks because it blocks the effect of the opioids. There are some challenges with it though, and if you're working with somebody who is interested in this, they need to know the risk and benefits of this medication. Okay. Each of these meds has a three-part series of induction, stabilization, and maintenance. Some of the most important things to understand with this though is that we have learned things since these medications were introduced and they are things that we need to practice as prescribers and healthcare providers to do the best work. We need to know the correct dose. It's not a one size fits all for the agonist. Vivitrol is closer to a one size fits all, but buprenorphine and methadone have to be titrated based on the individual. The big thing that is odd to hear a physician up here talking about is one of the goals, the main goal is to make sure cravings are controlled for an individual. We're not used to documenting cravings in a chart, but cravings are what drive the behaviors for people to think that using illicit substances again is a good choice. That's what we should always be doing with our patients. What, how do we understand how our patients think using something that is dangerous is a good choice? Cravings are one of the drivers in that area. And lastly, a big change is that maintenance phase may be indefinite now. We used to think one year, two year on this med, one year, two year on that, we get our therapy in there, we can do a rapid taper. Or some people are doing rapid tapers after detox. The outcomes are not good when those are being done. In fact, our next slide for everybody who needs to see a slide with a graph, because there's some academics here. Here's the slide. Okay. Y-axis and X-axis. This was a study published in 2016, a multi-center multi, a multi -center study with seven opioid treatment centers where they were following 1,080 patients and they were able to do almost 800 interviews of these patients. They, these folks were initially treated from 2006 to 2009, and then this follow-up period was from 2011 to 2014. What this axis is showing us is how many days per month, and these are months, of did, they, did folks have where they were using illicit drugs. This number went down in time. This is no medication. This is Suboxone, this is Methadone. 
this shows you that medications work for people who need medications. And we could talk all day, about, actually I don't want to talk all day about this one, but there's people on our team who would. The point is these meds work. That's the point of this slide. What, what this study also showed is that people who stay in treatment are less likely to overdose and more likely to have good outcomes. Okay? And in treatment does not mean inpatient treatment. It means in contact with their health professionals. And just so nobody walks out of here thinking Dr. Ratnick got up there and said treatment's not important, therapy's not important. <laughs> therapy is important. I, I tell my medical students all the time at St. Louis U, meds will work from this point forward. Medications do not address the coping mechanisms we have developed from this point up to here in order to stay alive, okay? In order to be flourishing as individuals, family members, community members, we need to address the behaviors that we uh, used in order to stay alive, whatever method we use to stay alive. So there is a role for both. What we need to look at though seriously or how we're using our funds. Okay. What can you do related to treatment? I know we're gonna have a call to action, Mel, but don't get mad at me for jumping the gun. Um, educate yourself on the evidence base of different treatment modalities. Contact your community substance use treatment providers to ensure medical treatment is available. You know who some of the most active people are to get people into recovery? Mothers, right? Know your rights in the court system. Medications used for opioid use disorder are medications for chronic illnesses. More and more we're getting more rulings to say that you can use medications to treat addiction and you, there cannot be arbitrary rules by probation and parole, by DYS, by other folks that are getting in the way of you getting the treatment you need to be healthy. If you're a physician, get wavered. Hunt me down, we'll talk about that. Support people who are finding success with medication. Every group in the United States, in the world, knows how to throw stigma at another part of their group, okay? If you have people that are successful on medication and their lives are better, their relationships better, they are flourishing in their community and as individuals, support them in that. We are not experts in everything. We need to give people the generosity of spirit to find what recovery works for them. And advocate for easier, broader access to treatment. Okay. Every exit goes through the gift shop. It's no different here at Washington University. There are tables set up outside if you have not seen them yet. We have bright smiling faces with our opioid state targeted response team that have information on where to get treatment, sites that are being funded in part through the, through the dollars through the program, information on overdose education and naloxone distribution. We have an implementation guide. If we don't have copies out there, we have it on our website, right? And if you don't, don't know how to find our website, ask any of us, we'll tell you. Something coming up, folks. A recipe book for the medical treatment of opioid use disorders. This is an, uh, more of a 15,000 foot view of what do you need to do to do this kind of care in your practice. So we're trying to make resources available to get more and more people engaged in this kind of treatment for patients who need it. Remember way back when, when nobody did mental health care unless they were prescribing, unless they were a psychiatrist? Well, we learned the hard way that primary care docs can do that too. Great, there's, a, there's roles for more than one profession and one specialty for a lot of the work we need to have done. So that, that's where we are. So with that being said, here's some more resources. I'm sure we'll be sharing those slides. Thank you very much for coming today. We're excited to hear what he has to say. Chad Sabora is co-founder with Robert Riley II of the Missouri Network for Opiate Reform and Recovery. Through their outreach center on South Broadway in South City, they provide a wide range of services for people needing help and their families. Chad got his under, undergrad degree 
at Illinois University, his law degree at John Marshall Law School. Now Chad and Robert offer free Narcan to those who seek it, along with a variety of counseling options. So please join me in welcoming Chad Sabor. All right, I don't have a PowerPoint today. Um, I have about 10 minutes. Um, and anybody that knows me knows I kind of go with the flow of um, what's being talked about. So um, I'm going to do what Fred did, and I'm going to break the rules a little bit. And if anybody knows me, they're not shocked. Um, and I'm going to do some call to actions while I'm talking. And I'm going to talk about some things just besides overdose education and naloxone distribution. Uh, that's going to be point three. Uh, but the first call to action, I just want to make sure that people hear, because uh, we have some things we could do today um, moving forward. So the most, one of the most important things I want to bring up is I want to bring up language um, as I'm talking here. Okay, I um, am in recovery from heroin addiction. I am not an addict. Certain 12-step programs or other um, modalities are going to use that terminology, and that's okay in those forums. But in a public forum, we have a responsibility. We have a message that we need to send to the general public, and that general public is, is going to decide what happens with funding, with how they view us, um, whether they're going to see us as a bright, smart individual with a mental health disorder, or are they going to view us as somebody that's going to rob them because they're shooting heroin in an alley. Um, so I employ everyone in this room today that this is your first call to action. Never use the word drug addict again. And I'll finish with that. My disease is not to define who I am as a human being, okay? So I'm going to start there. All right. Okay, since I had a request from Melba, so I have to change some things up now, fentanyl rumors. Fentanyl is scary. It's one of the scariest things we've ever faced in this country. And the DEA was correct. Um, clandestine labs all over the world are one step ahead of us, and they always will be. Because all they have to do is change one molecule, and it stays ahead of their scheduling. And, the, and they do the best they can to confiscate, test, figure out the medical structure, and then schedule that substance. The second that happens, we have a new fentanyl, and these are getting more dangerous. Um, I don't have my, I, I should have done a PowerPoint in retrospect of this one graph. If you could see the fentanyl chart um, from 2014 to 2017, it's a straight line, straight up as far as deaths go in fentanyl. Um, and people are scared. And we know history and uh, from just human psychology, what do people do when they're scared? they come up with things uh, to promote fear. Unfortunately, we have a media that also does similar things. So there's a lot of bad information going out there right now in the general public about fentanyl that I want to ease everybody's worries here right now. There is no such thing as Narcan-resistant fentanyl. Narcan is an antagonist. It knocks <coughs> opiates out of the receptors. Fentanyl is an opiate. The functionality works. The issue um, that we see with fentanyl um, is that uh, seconds will matter. Um, yeah, and you may need more. Um, than a regular dose of fentanyl, but seconds matter. If the fentanyl get, sits in those receptors long enough, they can almost grow roots. It will make it more difficult for the naloxone to displace it. So that's why peer-to-peer -peer and family naloxone access is so important. So my second call to action is that everybody in this room, about 500 in the overflow, between myself and another organization, uh, NCADA, who also uh, provides free naloxone distribution, I would hope by the end of the week, end of next week, Every single person in this room will have naloxone on them because they'll tell you where to go, how to get trained, and where to get it. So I employ everyone, that is your next call to action, to get Narcan. Um, other fentanyl rumors, just so, just so you can be aware, because I have to waste a lot of time on social media explaining things to people. Um, you can't overdose from touching it. Um, shopping carts don't have fentanyl on them that are making people drop like flies. Again, it's, it's scary, but again, back to the language. What does that do to the general public? that looks at us like we're some plague. These, these, these drug addicts, and I'm using that word because this is, goes with the theme, these drug addicts are getting fentanyl on shopping carts and they're killing innocent people. Why would we want to help them? So it is our responsibility to be honest with information, our responsibility to be honest with language, because the more we let things like that perpetuate, the less likely the general public out there that isn't here today who should be is gonna say, why would I help them? They're killing innocent people. And none of that, none of those rumors are true. 
So now let's go on to why um, they asked me to talk today, which is overdose education and naloxone distribution, which I've been doing for many years throughout the country. Um, and again, your call to action, get Narcan. <laughs> NCADA gives it out. Missouri Network for Open Reform and Recovery at 4022 South Broadway gives it out. Howard, I'm sorry, I forgot the address, but it's on the back of the STR card on the table out there. Get a card, call one of the organizations, and get Narcan. Peer-to-peer -peer naloxone access is the most important tool we have in this fight. Well, actually, the most important tool we have is Medicaid, but that's a different fight. Peer-to-peer <laughs> um, -peer naloxone access is the most important tool. First responders are amazing. The fact that we have it in in the cars and on the buses now is an amazing tool. However, being somebody that shot dope for 17 years, your first responder is your buddy sitting right next to you. Working with parents and grandparents that unfortunately have lost their children. First responders is when mom gets home and sees her child unresponsive. Narcan will work on all opiates. Timing is what's important. And in that 10 minutes it takes for mom to realize what happened, make a phone call for the ambulance to get there, they could have saved their child's life if they had Narcan, if they were trained properly. And it is very easy to use. Uh, Rachel asked me to do the little tester. I should have now in retrospect. Um, but it, it, it's low threshold Narcan is you go to Walgreens, you give them $150 your insurance card, and you get a box with two nasal sprays. And it goes up your nose, and you spray a button. And we do basic life support, which is just rescue breathing. These basic tools can keep people alive. Now you saw the numbers, and I know people are going off CDC numbers, and they're wrong. We're going to have lost 100,000 people in 2016 alone from opiates. Now to put that in context for everybody in the room, that's more people than the entire Vietnam War in one year. And yet we still need more call to actions. Again, on peer-to-peer -peer Narcan access, first off, everybody in this room has been affected, so everybody should have Narcan. I'm going to hammer that like two more times during my talk. Next is we have to get naloxone to the most crucial, critical, at-risk population. And we're doing that now in Missouri. Uh, through the STR grant, we are providing naloxone in jails. Leaving jail where your absence is based, forced, um, you're 120% higher risk for an overdose death. So right now, everybody leaving St. Louis City Jail is getting Narcan when they leave. Treatment courts, other compulsory treatments that sometimes are abstinence-based. As much as we have to push the medication first model, and I will reiterate things Dr. Fred said, I am in recovery. I got into recovery through abstinence-based models. Medication is the way to go right now, all right? <clears throat> Dependence does not equal addiction. Taking a medication every single day does not mean the person is still addicted. It's quality of life. If you look at the SAMHSA's definition of recovery, nowhere does it say abstinence. We have a moral compass here in this country that was set back in 1914, actually set in 1997, but that's another one of my talks. Um, and we need to break that moral compass. We need to look at things differently. We need to think outside the box. We're not doing things right. And we need to change things drastically. And luckily, you know, through the STR team, we were able to do that. Another average population is treatment centers. A lot are still using abstinence-based models, but through the MoHo project, which is MIMH and NCADA treatment centers are now getting naloxone and getting trained in naloxone. If you have a child in treatment, you need naloxone. If you have a loved one that has struggled at all in the past, we're not just talking heroin, any opiates. Especially, you know, we do have counterfeit pills on the market now, and I do break down bad false rumors, but they do exist. Um, you know, one of our good friends in Jeff City lost a family member to a counterfeit pill. Um, everybody, right now, in my opinion, because of its wide availability, everybody in this country should be carrying out Narcan. And everybody in this room, within two weeks, I hope, will take that call to action. And then I have one minute, so I will close with the moral compass. Think outside the box. We have to be data-driven. We know things work in certain countries, and we're still lagging behind to get those things accomplished here in the United States. Two things that we know without a doubt are saving lives in other parts of this country and around the world are twofold. First one is safe in, um, syringe access programs, needle exchange programs. They reduce hepatitis C, they reduce HIV, and people that use needle exchange programs are five times more likely to enter drug and alcohol treatment. What does that mean? That means it lowers the amount of use. I've heard people could call it enabling. If you're lowering the amount of use, that's actually the exact opposite of result of enabling. So that is something that we'll be pushing forward. And another call to action is there's gonna be a lot of legislation come January and we need everybody's support 
We have a war in Jefferson City to fight every year. It took us five years to pass the 9-11 Good Samaritan Law. Five years. We have to fight for needle exchange programs. We have to fight for a bunch of whole other laws. And information can be available at Missouri Network. We have a website, moannetwork.org. And the final moral compass we have to break are what are called safe consumption facilities. You may hear those called safe injection facilities, uh, but not everybody injects drugs. So we call them safe consumption facilities. 104 of those around the world. Controversial right now here. People are like, what? Never seen a death. Hepatitis C, HIV is reduced drastically. It helps public health. And again, much like needle exchange programs, people that access those programs are more likely to enter treatment because they are encountering people that are trained to talk to somebody actively using, they care, and they create resources that people don't know exist. STR is a wonderful example for some of the programs we do at Missouri Network. People walk in and have no idea that there is now free methadone, free buprenorphine, and free Vivitrol throughout St. Louis. I would say 99% of people that come to my office have no idea that exists, and they never would have found out unless they took advantage of some of the services that are somewhat frowned upon by our moral compass. So please read data, keep an open mind, um, understand that we have to think outside the box to make this work. And again, get Narcan in the next two weeks, everybody in this room, thank you. There has been a request for me to show how this works. So, this is Narcan. It goes right up somebody's nose, you push this little button, that will displace the opiates and the MU receptors, Narcan will take its place. Narcan is harmless, it's safer than Advil. It doesn't tell the brain to do anything. But since it sits in those MU receptors, there's no longer an opiate there. There's no longer a signal through the limbic system to the respiratory system to slow down breathing. The person wakes up typically within about 30 seconds. You may need one or more, two more doses if there is fentanyl, which there probably is, but you do get two doses in every box. And then if you follow the, the survival protocols, which is basic life support, rescue breathing, Narcan, call 911, we can cut down on death rates in this area drastically. Because based on what's happening with where our synthetics are going, we're not, we're not out of this yet, everyone. I wish I could give you some great news, but we have a fight against us, and we need everyone here to help us. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. And if you want to hear more of Chad's story, I think there was a recent Riverfront Times article pretty in-depth of everything that Chad does there in South City and on the opioid crisis in general. Uh, I'm going to invite back Dr. Rotnick. He did such a great job with the slides. We're going to let him come back and, and talk with people. We're going to hear the, the personal impact now of, of opioid abuse. So for this portion, turn it over to Dr. Rotnick. This is the part of the day I was really looking forward to because I have an Archie here and two Janines. <laughs> we have- I'm we, watching. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful opportunity to have folks from the community, our friends and neighbors to come in to speak from their own experience about some of the medications we've talked about before because I know that sometimes we keep addiction at a distance until there's people we care about. Mm. We can do the same things with medications. They're theoretical until we know someone who's taking them. Mm -hmm. So I would, we're going to let the panel do all the talking today and then we'll have some time for questions as well. And I would like, we'll let, we'll let Archie start here. And what I'm asking each panelist to do is talk a little bit about what started their addiction, a little bit about their history, did medications make a difference? If so, how? And then the other little tweak in, in um, honor of Chad is, did you ever have a Narcan rescue when you were using? So we'll start off with Archie. Okay. Y'all excuse me for not standing. My name is Archie Tysel, and um, I'm 64 years old, <clears throat> so I'm a child of the 60s. And um, 
my life was just set up for me to use heroin. Um, where, where I come from, I, I mean, for blocks, I don't think it was three fathers or father figures in the home where I lived. So my heroes, the people that I got information from were the older guy, the drug dealers, the car thieves, the burglars, the hustlers, we call them. And um, I didn't know any better. I wanted to be down. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be in. And uh, they told me, like, to be all the way in, you got to be hip. And you only can be hip by snorting dope, heroin. So I couldn't wait to get me a good blow, snort heroin. And um, that's how I started. And of course, uh, using it led to dealing it. And I was about 14, 15 years old, and uh, running errands for older dealers and prison back on the streets, the same thing for 30, 40, 45 years. Um, my last time in, uh, uh, I went in in 90, no, 91, and I was released in 2004. And uh, I said that things were going to be different this time. No more the old stuff, no more dealing, no more hustling. I had, I had never been married, don't have any children. So I was going to try to do something that I never did before. I was going to try to work an honest job, be an upright, standing person in society, right? Pay taxes. <laughs> that dream, of course, fell through about a month after I was out. The old <clears throat> so-called friends couldn't wait to get back to me because I knew how to do it just right. So I was offered some heroin and didn't know how to turn it down and was right back at it. So I used again for about <clears throat> two and a half more years. I had a probation officer that had faith in me, said that I had a lot more to offer. I was in a program called the Center for Life Solutions, and my counselor felt the same way, said I had a lot more to offer. So I had been, at this time, I had been in three different recovery programs, three different treatment facilities. Get out and go right back to using. My probation officer said she had never seen a judge give somebody these many chances. So one day, my, my counselor called me to the facility, the Center for Life Solutions, for a meeting. He said, your probation officer is going to be there. So I went and took my bag, a bag to go to jail with, because I noticed what they want. So I got there and, and when I got there, my mother and my wife was there also. By this time, I got married. So my mother and my wife were there also. So everybody is saying, like, what, you got so much more to offer. What can you, you got to do better with your life. And so many people look up to you and this, that, and the other. And I'm saying, I feel you. I hear what you're saying. But I'm a dope fan. I'm an addict. It's the first thing I think about when I open my eyes and the last thing I think about before I close them. I dream about it. I'm an addict. I don't even want to be this way, but I am. So my counselor, Mr. Brown, asked me, had I ever tried methadone? I told him, I've been trying. I mean, I've signed up for two different programs. And they both had a two-year waiting list. So I'm like, I want to do it, but what I'm going to do for them two years? Keep using? So he said, what if I can get you in the methadone program here? I said, when? He said, tomorrow. I said, I'll be here. Called me the next morning, said, come on down. The doctor will be here in about an hour. Came down, got examined, dosed that day. I haven't used since. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. God is good, and methadone is too. <laughs> In my case, um, I, I was just ready. I, I wanted to not be an addict. I wanted to stop. I wanted to, I wanted to do a lot of different things with my life. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even get a, a thought. Man, addiction is cold. I can't put it no better way. Addiction is slavery. Seriously, slavery. I've known good men and women to prostitute themselves just for a, a hit. Police, lawyers, good people. Slavery. So anyway, I got in the program, on the methadone program in June of 2006. As I said, I haven't used since. But now my battle is with getting off of methadone. So I'm in a program called uh, West Side or West End. West End. West End. <laughs> and uh, I, I say I'm leaving be there. <laughs> and I'm on a voluntary detox. I'm now trying to, I try to just quit, but that made me sick. That didn't work. You can't just do it like that. And I understand that my addiction is an illness, just like cancer is an illness. And for me, methadone is the medicine. So I'm on a, I'm on a voluntary detox, but until I reach the point where I, I believe I'm well, where I think I can make it without it, until then, I will continue to use methadone at whatever dose I'm on right now. But y'all pray for me because one day I'm going to make it up off this thing and life will be good. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. Okay, Janine. <laughs> Unless you want us to build to you, it's a big finish. It's okay. <laughs> but no. Okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Janine Young, and I am a recovering heroin addict. Um, so my story um, began a little bit later in life. Now, I started drinking and smoking marijuana and doing the typical things that, you know, shouldn't be typical for teenagers, but they seem to be um, at the age of 14. Um, but by the age of 30, I had my children and I had um, completely abstained from using any substance and raised my children and did what I needed to do. Um, at one point, um, I then divorced my husband. And uh, um, in 2008, I had some medical issues going on. And so I went to my primary and he prescribed me pain pills and then for 10 months I went through a series of tests that they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and I was um, misdiagnosed several times. And so the pain pills just continued for um, that 10 months and they started at the low end on a low dose and then by the time that I was preparing for surgery um, I was on Oxycontins on a, um, 40 milligrams which is a nice size dose. And so um, I had my surgery in 2009. Um, unbeknownst to me, I was addicted to the pain pills. Um, after my surgery, took my prescription pain pills. Um, and then when I ran out, I started having the stomach pains again. And I thought that my doctor did not perform the surgery properly because I had already gone through 10 months of being misdiagnosed and I thought there were a bunch of other issues. So I called my doctor back, I went in for a visit. He then again re-prescribed to me the Oxycontins. And then I maintained that for another three months. And then he called me, my surgeon called me in the office and stated that he thought that I could be addicted to the pain pills. Because as soon as I would run out of my prescription, because now, of course, I'm doubling up. I'm not taking them as prescribed, obviously. Cool. Um, every time I would run out, I would become physically sick. And I didn't know at that time um, anything about opiates. And so I didn't know that I was actually going through a withdrawal process. I just thought that it was similar to the same symptoms I had before my surgery. And so when my surgeon um, said that I was 
addicted to the pain pills, of course I disputed the fact and we went back and forth and um, he said that he was no longer going to prescribe me any medication. So then I went to my primary and told him my symptoms and my situation and so then of course I had wonderful insurance at the time with the job that I worked at and so then of course he just called in Walgreens and then I just started that cycle all over mm -hmm. again and then uh, um, that lasted about another six months before he caught on that I was addicted and now abusing my pain pills that then he called me in the office and uh, um, I had the same conversation, he believes I'm addicted, of course I disputed the fact and we went back and forth and then um, I did what all addicts do after he stopped prescribing me, I started um, doctor shopping and then hospital hopping and so I would just make my rounds to the ER, get a 30 day prescription, then I'd hit another ER, get a 30 day <laughs> prescription, hit another ER, I've been all over and so uh, um, you know if I would have had to go to Illinois I would have gone to Illinois. Um, and that, and that continued, um, so we're probably at about 2010 now. Um, I met a group of people um, that I became friends with and um, they were using heroin. And uh, um, of course I didn't do that because, you know, I'm not a junkie. I might take five pills, right. 40 milligrams of Oxycontin at one time, but I'm not a junkie. Right. And so, um, my prescription ran out one day. I called one of my friends. I'm like, I'm really sick. What do I do? He said, um, I said, and, and I can't. I just had a prescription filled, so I'm not going to be able to get another one filled for like, I don't know. It might have been like even 10 days or something because I was going through them, eating them like Tic Tacs. And uh, um, he told me that I could do some heroin. And I said, no, I cannot do that. I cannot inject anything into myself. I can't shoot myself up with dope. And he explained to me that I didn't need to, that I could snort it. Now, I had snorted cocaine in the past, so that didn't sound like a bad idea. I can snort. I just, just the idea, in my mind, coming from a middle class, white background, the, er, the era that I grew up in, you know, I'm, I graduated in the 80s. I wasn't familiar with people who had used needles. Um, I thought a junkie was something completely different. Um, you know, it was somebody who was homeless, on the street, just nasty, whatever. And, uh, um, but once I found out that I could snort it, I was okay with that. Then I crossed another line that I always said I would never cross. And so then that's what I did. So for the next two years, um, heroin ran my life. I mean, every day, like Archie said, when I woke up, it was the first thing I needed um, throughout the day. But when I went to bed, made sure that I needed to do what I needed to do and prepare myself for the next day, especially at the end of my addiction where I didn't have the nice income that I had prior and I had ran through my retirement money and my mutual funds and whatever else funding I had available um, at the end of my um, addiction career, I had to start preparing for the next day because I already knew that there was no, day, no way that I was going to be able to make it through that day without having any heroin. So uh, um, it's a lot of work to be an addict. Uh, you're very creative and it's more stressful than getting up and going to work every day, quite honestly. Um, and so that's what I did. So in 2011, I was in an accident and I broke my neck and I had a head injury. Now you would think that would have been the end, um, but for me, it was a great reason to not ever run out of drugs again because now I have a legitimate excuse that I'm going to have pain pills on deck. I can still use my heroin. I'm getting other medications. So um, from 2011 until I went into treatment, um, in December of 2012, I continued to use. Um, what had happened was um, I'm not a very good criminal and I had to do some criminal activities to get some money to, um, you know, fund my habit. And so um, I had got caught up in the legal system and um, my attorney suggested that I go to treatment and that's how I got into treatment. I had called Queen of Peace. Um, in the Central West End and I had had a friend in 2007 who I took to Queen of Peace and um, happily dropped her off 
and uh, um, one of, went back out and did, you know, handle my business. But um, so I, I was familiar with um, Queen of Peace, and so I contacted them at my attorney's advice. Went through, um, went into um, Queen of Peace in December of 2012, and at that time, I really was not ready to um, get clean and sober. I knew that I wanted to. In my heart, I really was miserable. I mean, honestly, I was hopeless at that point. Like, I was completely hopeless. And I was just an empty vessel, and I was just walking, you know, doing whatever I needed to do to get through the day. Um, and I wanted to get clean and sober, but I just didn't know how I was going to do that. And I couldn't imagine my life being a drug addict, being a dope fiend for the rest of my life, but I couldn't imagine not using every day either. Um, I was hopeless. And so I went in um, to Queen of Peace. Now, when I went in there at that time, they didn't have a medically assisted treatment program. Um, so I did go to a local hospital and I did detox. And then I went through their treatment program. Um, and in 2015, however, I was uh, uh, involved in two automobile accidents. And I already have neck and back injuries from breaking my neck in 2011. And so um, having the life that I have today, when I went to the ER after being rear-ended in the first accident, I um, right away I told the attending ER physician that I'm in recovery, I need something non-narcotic, um, but I'm in severe pain. And so um, he did give me a Toradol shot and that helped. And then I went to see a pain management specialist who was supposed to be well advised in recovery and understand um, how to help me get through my pain um, utilizing non-narcotics and of course not kicking off the receptors in my brain and uh, um, getting me craving again. Um, unfortunately for me, that was not the doctor. He prescribed me um, tramadol and a few other crazy things that I didn't really understand. And on acknowledging my part, I should have questioned, and I do that now, and I know that today, that I need to question. Um, I can't look at the physician or the doctor or whoever's in front of me, um, assuming that, you know, they're the doctor they're more educated. I have to be aware of my addiction, my disease, and what I need to do for to maintain my recovery. But um, sometimes when you're in pain, you're not really thinking that clearly. So you're thinking, like, I just don't want to hurt anymore. So what had happened was, of course, now I'm addicted to the tramadol and everything else that he had given me. So I had called my counselor um, at Queen of Peace, and I reached out to the director at Queen of Peace, and I told them both my situation and they um, suggested that I come in and see the doctor and um, use Suboxone to wean me down um, off of the medications that I, the pain pills that I was on. And so um, I did that. And at first, for me, the struggle was um, to utilize this Suboxone. I didn't have a problem with detoxing down off of what I was on because I already had had four years clean and I didn't like the way that I could tell that I was my thoughts were slower and all of that. So I knew I didn't want to continue using um, opiates or, or even a non-opiate but still puts me at the level where I can't think and function like I had been the last four years since I was clean. But I didn't, I had the stereotype that in my head and that stigma of um, Suboxone was going to be a crutch for me and that when I was at my, you know, my worst, when I was struggling to get clean, that I was able to not use any form of medication and get clean. And so that was a personal struggle that I went through. Um, so the doctor did wean me down off of what I was on and I um, eventually ended up weaning completely off of the Suboxone. And that lasted for about three or four months, and then I just have chronic neck and back pain, and I will the rest of my life just due to my injuries. And so then I went back to my doctor, and um, this is where education is so vital, um, because being an educated woman, I think I know it all, and I learn every day that I know less and less. But uh, um, education is vital because, and getting rid of the stigma and the stereotype with the medically assisted treatment um, 
that we need right now in our society, especially because for me, I don't know at what my threshold would be for pain that could just put me back over, you know, and send me back out to do things that I honestly don't want to do. Um, and, it, and obviously, from my experience with the car accident, I see it doesn't take much. I, it doesn't even have to be a Percocet today to put me over the edge. Tramadol can do that for me. So, um, it's, so it's important um, where education comes into play is I have a wonderful doctor who sat down and explained to me that for what is going on with my body and my disease and my chronic pain, that Suboxone is key to keep me to be able to function and do the things that I need to do in everyday life. And so that's why I do take my Suboxone daily. I do follow my doctor's direction. I do take it as prescribed and I educate it myself um, about exactly what is medically assisted treatment and how can it continue to benefit me and keep me living my life the way that you know I've worked so hard um, with the help of a lot of other people to get to my life to where I am today. Thank you very much, Jenny. Well, now, now, Janine number two, since you chose to go third, you get five minutes to take it on home. Can you do that? And would you guys be available after we finish today if there's people in the lobby who might want to ask you questions? Okay, good. So we'll set that up because I know we're not going to have time today because we've got a tight ship. But Janine, it's your turn. Okay, my name is Janine Campbell. I'm 28. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Um, I came from a home where there were no drugs, uh, no drinking, no smoking, cigarettes, anything. Um, to me, it looked like everything was perfect as I grew up. Um, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Just talk. But. Just Sorry. talk. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so, thank you. Um, growing up, um, I don't know where to start. I'm so sorry. Tell us a little bit about your life now. What do you have? Okay, that's better. Okay, so I'm going to start with where, how addiction was triggered. Um, there was a lot of things that took place in my life that I experienced that I didn't understand. And I didn't feel that anyone else would understand, could understand. I don't even think I even tried to talk to anybody about it. Um, so I started burying things. And I know I was looking for a release, a way out. Like, I just wanted somebody or something to take away. Mm. All the pain, disappointment, frustration, and what I call fa failures. Mm -hmm. Um. I first started chasing after men. I then learned I was looking for a father figure. Men became my addiction. Um, my father was present at home. He just didn't know how to raise me. Um, he would always say, go to your mother for everything, except money. Um, so, um, then after that, I found a group of people that knew something about Percocets and Vicodins. And I remember taking the first one, and I felt empowered. Mm. I felt invincible. I felt like I could do things I've never done. I could go talk to people and have a conversation I wouldn't have sober. Um, that stopped working for me. My body started becoming immune to it. So I later went searching for something I heard was stronger, which was heroin. And I found, I found that drug um, amongst a different group of people. And I say different because the heroin world, the, the I say the, I call them 
all drugs are bad, but it's just a different world when you meet people that do cocaine and heroin That's and, right. and <laughs> like a alcoholics, they're, they're, they, we all tend to migrate to people that are more like us. But I found this world who I thought these people were more like me and that they understood me better than anyone. Mm. So I found, I used to call the world the lost world because we were lost. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to uh, mention the day I started, I decided to get clean. I do remember May 23rd of last year, I asked my mother for money. And any other time I asked her, she'd give me a lecture. And she'd tell me how I'm destroying my life and how my son misses me and how much just she's hurt by it. But this particular time, she handed me money with no fight. And I, when I grabbed the money from her, I felt the release. I felt that everything was over. I felt that the only person I had in my corner praying for me had given up. Mm. So she made a comment when I was going out the door. She said, my birthday is in three days. I don't think it's any other present you can give me except to give your life, get your life together. So I left. The money I took from her was the hardest money to spend. Mm. I couldn't find anybody with it. The doors started closing. People who I thought were friends, they act like they didn't know me. Mm. I came back home May 25th. I was pregnant. Uh, I didn't know it. Actually, prior to that, I tried to get an abortion. They told me I was seven months, and it was $1,500. I later found out I was only three months. So I knew it was God. I wasn't supposed to get rid of that baby. But however, I came home May 25th, and I laid in the bed. I was sick. I had money, but I was tired. I didn't, I didn't want to go do it anymore. So I remember telling God, uh, I said, my mother's birthday is tomorrow. I want to be clean. And I said, and if you don't help me, I'll let her and die. So I remember he brought a thought to my head to make a call to a friend of mine who never answers the phone. <laughs> and he answered. And he was like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I need to go to St. Mary's. And he came right away and took me to St. Mary's. And when I say that was the best time of my life to meet people that actually knew I was sincere. Mm -hmm. I've told people I wanted to get clean so many times, they didn't believe me anymore. And when I spoke to the nurses there, they were like, we know that you're serious, we're gonna help you. They had turned away so many people. Mm -hmm. And they accepted me. I was the That's only one that day that they accepted. And from there, they got me into Center for Life Solution. But I'm sorry, midnight of May 26th, my mother's birthday, I was clean. And I've been clean since. Yay! 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 Simply because we could be here all day and listen to these three folks. We don't have time for questions right now, but our three panelists have ag agreed that they'll be available after our next panel discussion when we close up today. So they'll be available in the lobby. I'd like us all to really thank our panelists for the courage to be here today. We've got another panel discussion coming up, but before we do that, I think we've got another uh, polling question we want to have you take a look at an answer before we wrap up. Uh, this polling question is number four. Do you think our state and federal government should increase funding and infrastructure for evidence-based prevention and treatment related to addictions? Number one, yes. Number two, no. Number three, it's complicated. So do you think our state and federal government should increase funding and infrastructure for evidence-based prevention and treatment related to addictions. 
At this point now, we want to talk a little bit about, um, we've heard a lot, we want to talk about where do we go? What do we do now? Uh, we need to develop a plan to create some local strategies to address this issue. Uh, this next panel is going to be moderated by Dr. Rachel Winograd. Dr. Winograd is an assistant research professor at the Missouri Institute of Mental Health at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. She's also the program director for Missouri's state targeted response to the opioid crisis. Dr. Winograd's research pursuits have focused on all aspects of alcohol and drug use, consequences, and treatment. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Winograd. Hi everyone, we're closing out the day today. Thank you for sticking with us. That was a really tough act to follow. So throughout the course of the morning, we've heard a lot about how we got here. We've heard about etiology of drug use and addiction, efforts that we can focus toward prevention and law enforcement, and the importance of medications, both to acutely save lives from overdose and to assist people in long-term treatment and recovery. As we heard from Dr. Fred and Chad, there is hope in treatment. There is hope in recovery. There is hope to have meaningful, fulfilling lives, even for something so devastating and so primary and so chronically relapsing as opiate use disorder. What we may not have stressed thus far today is why we're talking so much about St. Louis and why this really brought a big crowd today. So to be clear, even though nationally we are seeing geographical and demographic shifts, in Missouri, the hot spot is still St. Louis. 70% of deaths last year were in the eastern region of this state with 50% of them in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. It is still affecting poor people and people of color. Black people were twice as likely to die last year in Missouri than white people. So to be clear, with these summits and with this energy and with this funding, it's excellent that we have a renewed vigor and dedication, but we need to make sure that it reaches everyone amongst us. This is not our first drug crisis. It's costing us the most lives, but we have been here before, as has been mentioned today. We've seen evidence of what works and what doesn't, and yet nationally, and even here, we're based in fear and we continue to have pushes for increased drug penalties and catching bad guys when we know that that just doesn't work when it comes to preventing drug use and death. What we do need is reliable and sustained funding for research-based practices. This does not mean that we should divert funding from things we still desperately need, housing programs, other health care funding, social services. Anyone who's lived and died in this life in St. Louis will tell you that those are vital and that those are a part of this puzzle. And to be sure, when it comes to overdose deaths, there are pieces of this puzzle that are more important and that are more likely to save lives than others. But we need to be very intentional and thoughtful and honest with ourselves when it comes to our approach to putting this, this messy puzzle together. So the purpose of today's panel, and I'd like to invite our panelists up here, make your way. The first is to highlight existing efforts in both the public and private spheres that are underway right now in St. Louis, right here at home. 
For everyone who exclaims that no one out there is doing anything about this epidemic, they need look no further than the panelists we have here with us today. Surely we can do more, we should be more, do more. I hope that everyone leaves this summit today with a sense of urgency and taking it upon themselves to do something different. But we have here with us experts who have made it their mission and their life's work to make a difference. Today's panelists are working both on the ground and up high to bring healing and hope to families and communities because we know that something like addiction does not just exist within an individual, it exists within our families and our peer groups and our communities. The second purpose of this plan panel is to focus on women. Women's health, women's functioning and thriving and the power of women to give a voice to the voiceless. We know many of these issues stem from access to care, health disparities, and criminal justice. We also know that many of the solutions that we've described today apply to all humans, and women are no exception. However, we have learned from our history of medical research and policy making that if we ignore the voices of women and the unique elements of women's lives as we develop public health policy and approach, we do a massive disservice to our entire population. So I'm honored to introduce our panelists now and we'll follow with specific questions from me and uh, hopefully maybe a question or two from the audience, although I will respect our time. Okay, first I would like to introduce Dr. Jay Shikin, joins us on the end. She's a practicing physician and associate professor in the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Women's Health at St. Louis University. She's the founding medical director of the WISH Clinic. Many of you have heard of this. Women's and Infant Substance Help through SSM Health. It's where our final speaker, Janine, I believe, uh, received help. And uh, we didn't get to hear about the end of her journey. But she's here with us today, largely in part to Dr. Scheichen. She has over 20 years of experience in treating addiction disorders in pregnant women and serves on several task forces uh, to address the current opiate epidemic, both in Missouri and Illinois. She is also a certified yoga teacher with a further certification in prenatal yoga and 12-step recovery yoga. Moving on. Laura Pennington is the CEO of Queen of Peace Center. You've heard that mentioned as well in people's treatment and recovery journeys. Queen of Peace is a family-centered behavioral health care provider for women, children, and families impacted by addiction here in St. Louis. Queen of Peace has been providing addiction care for women and families for over 32 years. We are then joined by the Honorable Cora Faith Walker. She's a representative of our 74th district. This includes but is not limited to Ferguson, Florissant, Hazelwood, Jennings, and other municipalities that are being particularly hard hit by the current crisis. She has a strong background in public health and has been incremental in passing recent legislation to improve access to the medication, to medications for the treatment of opiate use disorder, which I'm sure she'll share with us uh, in just a moment. Then I'd like to introduce Detective Casey Lambert with the St. Louis County Police Department. She's worked closely with St. Louis County Department of Public Health and St. Louis County Police Department to spearhead the naloxone program in St. Louis County such that every police vehicle is now carrying naloxone and has, they've saved numerous lives from this program. And last but not least, Jerry Michael is the Director of Strategic Initiatives with Generate She's been involved in maternal and child health issues for over 25 years and currently leads the Perinatal Behavioral Health Initiative. She partners with all the women's substance use treatment providers in this area and can help us understand this issue from a systems perspective. Okay, I'd like to hand it over to our panelists. And can you please start by going down the line and in a few brief moments, maybe let's cap it at three moments, three minutes each if you can, tell us a little bit about the work you do and what strategies you currently employ to address the opioid crisis in St. Louis. 
My name is Jay Shagan. I'm a maternal fetal medicine uh, subspecialist, St. Louis University, and I am the um, medical director of WISH, which is, stands for Women and Infants Substance Health. So it is a multidisciplinary operation. I don't want to call us a clinic because we're really a doctor's office, um, where we address um, all addictions during pregnancy, but primarily our, our focus right now is uh, in opioids. So we are staffed by a multidisciplinary team. Uh, I work with uh, three nurse practitioners, essentially two uh, FTEs. This is a full-time operation. Uh, three RNs, a sonographer, a clinical pharmacist, very important part of our team, medical assistant, So it's hard for me to speak without slides like my colleagues. So, um, so I just want to um, say that what we do in our um, office is we link women with chemical dependency treatment. We're going to be onboarding a chemical dependency counselor as well in the in the future. In the actually in the in the need, new year future. Um, we're linking people with financial counseling services, and it's at a time for us to uh, be able to help women sign up for uh, Medicaid. This is a uh, pregnancy is an expanded uh, population. We provide prenatal education. Um, we also provide immunizations, and this is pretty a key thing that, uh, that we do, and our, our rates of immunizations are far greater than that in the general population. Um, we case manage people and actually help them uh, navigate the difficulties in getting into chemical dependency treatment, and we provide MAT on site uh, through uh, Subutex um, or Suboxone. But other really important things that we have to do are link people with other essential services in addressing their addiction. So mental health uh, disorders is key. GI. Um, physicians for people with uh, hepatitis C, although we are starting to uh, treat ourselves, just not during pregnancy, um, infectious diseases, and most importantly, with a primary care physician. So our goals through WISH are to preserve families, and 98% of the women that come through our program do go, their babies do go home with them or a uh, direct family member. We're trying to improve healthy pregnancy outcomes, minimize the, um, the neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is the withdrawal from narcotic medication, whether it be uh, through MAT or whether it is their, their drug that they were using. Otherwise, there is a risk of uh, NAS to minimize that, but also minimize the impact of NAS should it occur in a family and help women address it because women are the best treatment for uh, their babies with NAS. Um, and then we help try to build in relapse prevention. Um, and most importantly, we help guide through people through the appropriate management of relapse, because we certainly know that this is a chronic disease. So I'm glad to be sitting by Dr. Scheichen. She's been Queen of Peace Center's partner in crime for almost 30 years. So Queen of Peace Center You're is really like five years old. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, everyone talks bad about millennials, but I am one, and we are actually going to change the world. Yes. Um, but enough about millennials and more about Queen of Peace Center. So we started in 1985, really in response to the crack epidemic. So, you know, we had discussed earlier with Dr. Rotnick that at that time, what we knew and what we were doing as a community was criminalizing addiction. And what we saw during the 80s is that women were incarcerated, their children were removed from their custody. And so not only did we have mounting costs, but we weren't addressing the root cause. So when Queen of Peace Center started in 85, it was with the intention of serving women and restoring families. Most drug and alcohol treatment centers in the 80s, and really still to this day, do not accommodate the needs of the children. So if you are a mom struggling with addiction, quite often you're forced to make the decision to either get clean and sober, um, in the hopes that your children have a safe place to go, 
or not to get sober because you don't have a healthy or supportive um, network of care. So when family-centered treatment providers and agencies emerged in the 80s, it really was to address this issue of women and mothers and their children to break the cycle of multi-generational addiction. Um, and through aggressive prevention and education strategies, um, not only to serve the women, but their children. So in terms of our approach, it is treating women in a gender-specific and trauma-informed environment, and it's also providing early intervention and prevention to their children so that they never have to walk through our doors 20 years down the road. We do so in a very comprehensive way, and what you'll hear in our discussion, women need comprehensive wraparound services. It's not just about the addiction and the root cause. We know that women, if they don't have childcare, if they don't have transportation, if they don't have housing, it's going to be nearly impossible for them to stay sober. And so our model is the whole family, women, children, partners, significant others. Certainly family for the women is defined, um, does not have to be biological in nature. It's whoever they identify as a member of their support system. We provide um, the treatment, the housing, prevention, education. We have two on-site childcare um, agencies that are part of Queen and Peace Center to serve those children. And we certainly do this with a whole host of providers. So we partner very we closely and we do have yoga, 12-step <laughs> yoga. Um, we have a whole host of agencies that help us and support us in our efforts. Um, to help these women maintain sobriety. What we do know, and Janine pointed this out, is five years ago we did not have a comprehensive MAT program. We now do, where we offer Vivitrol, Naltrexone, Subutex, Suboxone, and Methadone by referral. We have a psychiatrist, we have a primary care physician, and a family nurse practitioner on site. So it's not only about the wraparound services, but also the primary care and the medication-assisted treatment. And I'm gonna hand it over because I know we have to be mindful of time. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I, as Rachel said, my name is Cora Faith Walker. I'm the state representative of the 74th district. Um, I was elected last year, and um, I currently sit on the Children and Families Committee as well as the Health and Mental Health Policy Committee in the Missouri State House of Representatives. Um, last year, uh, when I got up to session, um, the first bill that I ever filed was House Bill 710, which would have allowed for medication-assisted treatment in drug courts. By the end of session, we passed legislation to allow for medication-assisted treatments in drug courts, family courts, and veterans courts here in the state of Missouri. And um, uh, really thanks to a lot of the people who are in this room and a lot of the stories and the expertise and um, the evidence that um, you all have as um, people who interact with and provide care and uh, support for uh, folks that are um, dealing with substance use disorders and opioid use disorders. Um, I uh, have a background in public health. I've got my master's of public health from right here at Wash U um, at the Brown School. And so the approach that I took um, and uh, in trying to advance that legislation and really um, all sorts of uh, legislation that, I, that we've been promoting around substance use disorders and opioid use disorders is um, exactly what uh, the previous panelists have, have been uh, talking about. But it's really the idea of uh, moving away from criminal, criminalizing uh, a health disorder, criminalizing um, a health care issue. What we really want to do and try to do is provide people help and not handcuffs and really try to focus on prevention, um, but also focusing on it, and I hope that we'll get a chance to talk about it, um, the, the emotional pain that a lot of um, people experience that, that have substance use disorders and really trying to get to what can we do to address those sorts of uh, deep-seated uh, behavioral mental health issues and provide supports and, and wraparound services for that. And so I'll be talking about some legislation that we're going to be um, advancing uh, next year coming up soon. Hello, my name is Casey Lambert and I work for St. Louis County Police Department and I left my handcuffs at home today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been lucky enough to be in this position since January 2015. Uh, we, I personally work under the roof, the same roof as FBI, DEA, U.S. Marshals, um, National Guard, almost 22 other municipality police departments around our area, uh, and honestly we all work together under the Multi-Jurisdictional Drug Task Force. 
as a great group. Um, and since January 2015, we've had positions in our office that allow us to do only community outreach, and that's what I solely do. I do no enforcement. Um, and typically, on an everyday basis, I'll reach out to the community and bring them up to date on the drugs that we're seeing, what our lab results are coming back with, um, our medical examiner's reports, uh, the different drugs that we're seeing in the different areas, what they're mixed with, uh, the age groups that it's affecting, um, and different uh, statistics such as that. Also, we reach out to other schools. We try to get into the health classes, um, much like NCADA, and just provide education um, by that means. Also, on top of that, um, working for a great police department of 800 to 900 police officers, what better way to start bringing Narcan to our community with equipping that many officers, right? You gotta make some type of difference. So with, uh, within the past few years, we've been able to do that. And since then, those 22 other police departments that I work under the same roof with, I believe all 22 are carrying Narcan as well. So that's great. Thank you. Hi. Well, Hi, I'm Jerry Michael. I'm with Generate Health, and I've had the privilege over the last six years to build an integrated, interdisciplinary, multi-sector um, referral, case management, and screening initiative. That means that we are working with primary care providers, whether they're behavioral health, OBs, pediatric family practice doctors, to get women screened according to the professional guidelines while they're pregnant, which is basically every 90 days. If they screen of concern, then they are referred into a case management model with 13 other partners in the community, many of whom are in the room or we work with. The women are then assessed, a treatment plan is developed, and they begin to move forward in their life. So we work really closely with the two ladies at the other end of the table for women who have substance use concerns. The reason I'm here today is to really speak about how can we enhance this on a prevention and early intervention side. If we're screening women as early in pregnancy and getting them linked up to services, whatever that might mean in order for them to stabilize their lives and really to achieve emotional wellness, and then screen their children for social emotional concerns as early as possible, perhaps we will have some kind of improvement as we move forward over the next five to 10 years. It's taken us six years to get to the point where we have 13 partners at the table sharing comma agenda, which is to screen women, provide them access to whatever services that they need, and then to walk through a case management process with them so that they can stabilize their lives. We're at the intersection now. We serve currently through our funding with MHB 10% of the perinatal pregnant or postpartum population in the city of St. Louis. We're estimating that somewhere between 60 and 70% of those women are instably housed, unstably housed. That's a nice way of saying that they don't have a place of their own to live. This is about the social determinants of health, providing housing, transportation, education, child care, and access to whatever kind of medical or behavioral health services a woman and her family needs in order to achieve optimal wellness. I have my own call to action today through the Flourish Infant Mortality Initiative. We would like to invite anybody who is interested in figuring out how do we put together a sustainable plan that incorporates managed care, insurance companies, the hospitals, anybody who is taking care of women who are in this situation, women and children, to come to the table and help us figure out how to partner with the state to provide services for a minimum of 12 months postpartum. I would prefer that it was two years. If you're interested, please see me afterwards. I'll be in the lobby. Thank you. Okay, I just heard we're even shorter on time than I thought. So. 
we'll pick it up. Okay, for this next question, I'm going to just address it to Dr. Shikin. If anybody has any burning desires to jump in after, uh, please do so quickly. It was recently written uh, in an article uh, entitled, Women Also Use Drugs, Not That You Could Tell from Drug Policy. This quote, nowhere is the lack of consideration of women's specific experiences with drugs more apparent than in the UK's Drug Strategy 2017. The strategy only mentions women three times, as victims of domestic violence, as sex workers, and in relation to drug-related deaths. It in no way tries to tackle the unique harms women face, nor the significant barriers to treatment, despite the fact this may be one of the drivers for the tragic rise in women dying. Dr. Shikin, what are some of these unique harms and barriers referenced in this quote? Thank you. First, we need to recognize that addiction may be different for women than it is for men. So women are more likely to have pain, are more likely to receive narcotics for pain. Women are more likely to somaticize their distress, their underlying dis-ease um, with pain. And chronic pain syndromes, things like fibromyalgia, uh, rheumatoid arthritis may be just more common in women to, to begin with. It appears that women are a little bit more sensitive um, to craving, and there's also a telescoping of the process of addiction, so that women tend to progress more rapidly through dependence and then starting to exhibit the behaviors that characterize addiction. So women going into treatment are further along in their disease than men um, in a comparable uh, situation. So one out of every three persons who is um, using drugs and meets the DSM-5 for addiction are women. Only one out of five people who are in treatment for their addiction are women. So there clearly are some barriers in women uh, and chemical dependency treatment and across the continuum of that kind of care. Um, we see transportation is really one of the biggest drivers. And when you think about it, if the um, some um, more dominant person in that family is the owner and driver of the car, they may have difficulty getting around. If you have children, making your way through transportation services and public transportation may be more difficult. But probably more importantly is in the process of addiction, many people have sort of lost their uh, support network and their community resources that help them get to the services uh, that they need. So access can be um, an issue. And a very important issue for women as well is the stigma that's related to getting help and asking for help, particularly if they're pregnant. So there are some women who will spontaneously um, have a, a remission during pregnancy, which is, let me not min minimize what hard work that would take um, on her part. But if she is still using and cannot stop using during pregnancy, this is almost by uh, almost by de definition is a severe uh, problem. But there's a lot of fear and distrust in coming in for care, admitting that they need help. Um, there's concern for uh, children's division coming in and um, taking their children from them because they've come in and asked for help. And they, they fear that they're putting the rest of their family members, their other children, at risk. Child care is a huge issue. The cost of chemical dependency treatment, particularly if they don't have Medicaid, and the cost of um, Medicaid um, or, or medication-assisted uh, treatment. The other thing is that we also know that women are more likely than men to um, use opioids as a way to treat internal pain, and we've known for a very, very long time that opioids treat way more than physical pain, that they treat the psychic pain as well. So 
Much of this is borne out by a history of trauma, and I would say 100% of our um, patients in WISH um, are either victims of trauma, have witnessed trauma, or then suffer trauma as a result of their um, addiction. But not all treatment is truly trauma-informed, and we can inadvertently um, perpetuate uh, these maladaptive uh, patterns. And our biggest crises right now are that that we can't get the partner into treatment. Um, and it is very, very difficult to maintain sobriety in the context of a relationship when someone is still using. Remember, he is not part of a Medicaid expanded population and may have difficulty getting, um, getting services. Um, and then people lose their Medicaid after they deliver, so 60 days after they deliver, and then recovery that um, has been achieved is going to be at risk. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and clap. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna skip ahead. Representative Walker, I think that was a good segue. In 90 seconds, yeah. or less, can you talk to us a little bit about what we should plan to see from you in Jefferson City this year legislatively and how community members can help when it comes to legislative action to address this opioid crisis? Sure, I will try to do it in 60 seconds. So um, one thing that we will likely see that um, Chad talked about earlier is uh, syringe access. Um, last year, uh, the syringe access bill actually made it through um, health, our health and mental health policy committee, and so um, we're looking to see that again next year. Uh, the second thing relates to um, expanding access to medication-assisted treatment um, after the five days that um, it's currently the cutoff for uh, nurse practitioners to be able to uh, prescribe MAT. Um, the third thing is going to be uh, expanding uh, Medicaid for pregnant women past those that 60-day mark. Um, I'm sorry, not expanding, extending Medicaid um, for extending. pregnant women. I don't mean to say the word expansion. Um, and then finally, and this is this is the big plug um, that I that I want to push is we're talking about trauma and trauma-informed approaches um, and, and the importance of trauma um, and. and uh, the correlation between people being exposed to trauma and the likelihood of them uh, developing some sort of substance use disorder or opioid use disorder um, is uh, the, the number one piece of legislation that I'm going to be championing this year is called the Trauma-Informed Approaches for Missouri's Children and Families Act. And um, what it is, you know, what we really have to do is try to ensure that the systems and the settings that um, come into contact with children who have been exposed to um, trauma, who have had some sort of adverse childhood experience, um, have the sorts of tools and the resources and the funding the funding that they need to both recognize, address, and, and treat trauma so that we can work on this whole prevention uh, piece. And so, um, you know, uh, that's, that's going to be the, the big piece. Missouri's done an incredible job already um, with, with uh, really taking the lead, I think, on um, trying to help create and implement systems that are trauma-informed. And so this is really uh, going to be designed to take a very comprehensive sort of approach that um, encourages and incentivizes trauma informed approaches in social services settings, in healthcare settings, in education, as well as um, amongst first responders and justice and um, justice uh, related settings as well. And so what I will need from you is what a lot of the folks in this room have already done and have been incredible at, which is to um, continue to educate the public and educate um, my colleagues in the state legislature about the impact and the um, importance of uh, being trauma informed and how it relates to uh, the opioid epidemic, as well as come up and advocate and tell your stories. I mean, as much data and information as we might get, I, there's nothing that can uh, that can surpass the sorts of stories that we just heard in the previous panel earlier. And those are the sorts of things that people like um, me and, and the folks that I rep, uh, work with in the state legislature need to um, continue to hear. So looking forward to um, continuing to work with all of you. It's a little over 90 seconds, but. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, very sadly, we have less than a minute left, and we haven't really been able to hear much from Jerry, Detective Lambert, or Laura. So the three of you, in a phrase, here's a challenge. This wasn't on the list, so good luck. In a phrase, please tell the audience what you think is the key solution in your field 
to closing the treatment gap, saving lives, and putting this crisis behind us. a sentence and not a phrase. In, in no other field do you treat a disease with grant funding and donations. So we've, we've heard the solutions today. We, we know what needs to happen, but we can no longer accept three-year grants and one-time donations to effectively get to the root cause. We need sustainable and expanded funding to treat this as the disease that it is. Um, absolutely, we need to really th completely revise our thinking to really look at a chronic disease model. Um, this is not just about substance use, it's about mental health, domestic violence, it's about trauma. Everything is underlaid with trauma in our community for the people that we're serving. Um, we need to quit doing things the way we've always done it. We have got to be able to step out as a community and say we are done playing this game like we have always played it. Please get involved with those of us that are really out here putting together system level changes in how all of us are going to relate to each other. We need every single voice in this room and in the community in order to elevate this issue, the issue of infant mortality, and the other issues that we have in our community that are telling us that we are really, really sick. Please get involved. And real quick, for the first responder side, we did not do this job um, we did this job to serve and protect. We did not do this job. We did not sign up for this job to make any judgment on anybody else. So put the judgment aside, show up, save lives. Uh, if you have to, do what I did and put yourself in the mother's shoes of the child that's going through the problem or the husband. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Dr. Ross, we've heard a lot today, but a couple of things I want to say and then I'll turn it over. You heard that this is not new. It's been around a long time. Dr. Fred said we failed. We failed. But we can do something about it today and moving forward. Chad said some things that we can do right now. Each of us has a role. Each of us has a role that we play in this. And we have to come together. I was talking to someone and they said, we really don't know what everybody is doing and we really need to think in terms of where the gaps are. So my charge is that in 30 days, you're going to, well, in a week, I'm pushing my staff so they know this is me. In about a week, you're going to receive a survey. We want to know your thoughts. But more importantly, what I want to see is what have you committed to doing? I want to have an assembled committee to really pull us together to strategize on where are the gaps, what should we be doing, how are we going to collectively work together to go to Jeff City to support our legislators, to educate, to help educate at the local level so that we understand we can't function with misnomers. We can't function unless it's factual. But more importantly, from this panel, you, you got to do it from this. It's about this. And seeing the good in people, all people, and wanting to do something about it. Had it not been for the Laura Penningtons and the, the Queen of Pieces of the World and NCADA, what they do every day on the lines, Dr. Shank and Dr. Cicero and Dr. Ross, all the medical providers, what you do every day is very important. And we're not saying you're not doing enough. We need to help lift you up. This is a big lift. 
Public health cannot do it alone. I have a housing homeless person agency. Irene said, whatever I can do, I'll be here. That's the momentum we have to leave here with. We must be committed in doing something, and we must come together and overcome the negativity and bring hope and healing to our community. What do you think, Dr. Rock? I think so. Well, uh, Director Moore, I am equally uh, passionate about this. And uh, at, at the conclusion, uh, displayed on the screen here, are some really uh, um, solid, uh, actionable items that we can move forward with uh, after this uh, session is over. I really appreciate our representative, uh, Cora Faith Walker, for really nailing what needs to be done in Jefferson City. We have faith in you and all the, all the legislators to take this forward. We also have faith that the community will continue to push for a statewide, uh, a fully funded prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, we're going to make that happen. Well, we don't want to be the only state in the country to not have one. So uh, that is a commitment to push on that effort. So I don't want to take the time to enumerate those action items other than the, the um, deliberations of this summit are, are going to be captured, synthesized, and displayed uh, on our website. Uh, the overarching theme of what we're going to display is that, you know, using the terms we just heard from this committee, is that we need to have a multi-level strategy focusing on prevention. We, it needs to be interdisciplinary. We have to incorporate the social determinants. We have to stop uh, uh, blaming and start developing more of a, of a concrete approach, uh, which uh, allows all of us to be engaged. And lastly, I love this, I love this statement. Uh, again, this is based on the, on the responses we've seen, uh, th th this has to be uh, a, an effort that looks across the whole state and look, uh, looking at communities that are traumatized, individuals that are traumatized, uh, uh, communities and neighborhoods that are traumatized. And the trauma-informed care model is essential to guide this forward. We are fortunate in, in having a, a nonprofit alive and well that is really charged to deliver this service. And if you're not aware of that, uh, that is one action item I want you to do when you go back. Look up uh, Live and Well, and we'll be bringing them in. We have to deploy them across uh, our region to really address these uh, strategies. And so you have what, what we're going to do here. Uh, Director Moore and I are absolutely committed to uh, in ke in keeping this audience engaged and informed. So thank you for a remarkably instructive day. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'm thrilled. I'm charged. And uh, let's go ahead and, and make this a reality. Let's, let's address this issue uh, from the root cause. Thank you. And last but not least, I said when we started this, we made St. Louis last because we knew we would have the best. Thank you, everyone. And to our speakers, thank you. Fred, thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.